to your cell phones and please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we have a number of proclamations this evening, and the first, um, very relevant to the Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, is the National Day of Racial Healing. Um, it's actually National Day of Racial Healing Day, which is a little redundant. But, and I, I don't have my written agenda here with me, but Kimberly, I believe you're okay. So Kimberly Archie, our Equity and Inclusion Director, will um, come up to receive this proclamation and her now fully staffed team who is here as well. Okay. Whereas we have all witnessed racism continuing in America's urban, rural, suburban, and tribal communities today that threatens the very core of this great country's unified front. And whereas just like those who came before us, it is our duty to protect the children of Asheville and maintain communities in which they may all be given the opportunity to succeed. And whereas we understand and recognize that there is a radical, oh, I'm sorry, racial divide in Asheville and this country that we must all work earnestly to heal the wounds created by racial, ethnic, and religious bias and build an equitable and just society so that all children can thrive. And whereas all children have the right to be provided every opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive in nurturing environments, and children of color face unique obstacles that prevent their access to opportunity as a result of historical and current systems, policies, and practices. And whereas if we all dedicate ourselves to the principles of truth, racial healing, and transformation, we can all bring about the necessary changes in thinking and behavior that will propel the city of Asheville forward as a unified force where racial biases will become a thing of the past. And whereas racial healing is a vital and crucial commitment to the education, social, mental, and overall well-being of our children, and whereas Asheville has a unique responsibility and opportunity to transform institutions and systems by using a specific lens to change policies, practices, and procedures that promote racial inequities while simultaneously ensuring everyone is better off. And whereas the city of Asheville, in conjunction with others throughout the United States of America, acknowledges the National Day of Racial Healing and commits to taking action as a municipality to make systemic changes in policies and practices that foster racial healing and advance racial equity. Now therefore I, Esther Manhammer, Mayor of the City of Asheville, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim that the city honors and recognizes January 22nd, 2019 as National Day of Racial Healing Day in Asheville and urge all people to promote racial healing and transformation in the ways that are best suited for them individually as a means to working together to ensure the best quality of life for every child. So thank you, Mayor. We know that racial trauma is very real, and we must also acknowledge government's role in traumatizing its residents to begin the healing process and to build relationships for trust to increase. Tonight's proclamation is a first step in our, for our city government, um, and here to receive tonight's proclamation is 
Phyllis Utley with Kofita Cheeky, as well as Dwayne Barton with Hood Huggers, practitioners of racial healing work in our community. Thank y'all, and I hope we actually put some blood and some money behind this proclamation. So last June, City Council adopted the Equity Action Plan and the 2018-19 budget, which included three full-time new positions for the Office of Equity and Inclusion. As of today, our team is now complete. I'd like to introduce, first I'd like to thank uh, City Council for their commitment to advance, advancing racial equity. And I'd like to introduce uh, our team to the rest of the to the council as well as to the rest of the city. We have Yashika Smith, who is our inclusive engagement and leadership manager, who began in October of 2018. We also have Paulina Mendez, our training consultant, who started November of 2018, and Nia Davis completes the set. <laughs> She is our human relations analyst, and today was her first day on the job. <laughs> Through our internal and external strategies um, that are listed in the Equity Action Plan, these uh, women will uh, work with me and the rest of the staff of the city to embed racial equity um, in everything we do. So again, thank you. So although Nia officially started her work today, being the fourth uh, member of the equity inclusion team, the whole team was in Charlotte last week for the GAIR training, and I'll always flub up what GAIR stands for, but um, it's a racial equity training that's, that is geared towards cities to help them um, institutionalize equity in their cities. Uh, very pragmatic, uh, helpful workshop. We spent two days there. and. Um, I've found out a lot of information to bring back to our city. And Kimberly, our director, was instrumental in organizing that event and planning it as well. All right, thank you. Um, the changing gears here, the next um, <laughs> proclamation is Celebrate Tennis Week. And Councilman Julie Mayfield is going to present this proclamation because she loves tennis and plays tennis. And I know Deb Bradford's here. And Deb, if you've got anybody with you, please bring all your tennis people up here. Uh, as these folks are coming up, the, the purpose of this uh, um, proclamation is because it is proclaiming the week before the Fed Cup to be Tennis Week. Uh, as I hope everybody knows at this point, the Fed Cup is uh, coming back to Asheville. This is the first time in somebody tell me how many years that the 14 years that the Fed Cup has returned to a host city. So we treated them really well last year, uh, and that is due in large part to, oh, pretty much everybody here and lots of other people. Uh, but they loved it, and uh, they are coming back. And I don't know if we can sort of create a continuing repeat situation, but um, the Fed Cup was great for the city last year. Um, let me see if I can just do a couple of these, uh, tell you a little bit about it before I get into the proclamation. So. Um, uh, from a sort of, sort of hard dollars standpoint, Fed Cup brought in about $3.5 million in spending to the city over that, the course of that weekend. That's a two day, just a two day event. Um, about 45% of the ticket, uh, ticket holders were local Asheville people and about 55% came from outside of Asheville. So that tells you we've got a huge uh, tennis fan base here in the city, as well as of course Asheville being a regional draw for people who come from far away. Fed Cup also really catalyzed a lot of um, 
energy, new energy around tennis in Asheville, and I just want to read you a couple of uh, a couple of stats about what it's done. So, um, hopefully, everybody knows Aston Park, which is our kind of our premier tennis city, tennis center, clay courts. Um, pass holders at Aston were up 30% over the year before, uh, at least in part due to Fed Cup. The participants in the Asheville Open, which is our big tournament, it is the where it is the yeah, oldest. The oldest open tournament tennis in the South, 88 years, been going on 88 years, so quite a legacy there. Um, and uh, participation increased 62% for juniors and 34% for adults. That's just not an accident. Um, the number of juniors playing at Aston Park more than doubled last summer. Again, not an accident. And uh, Aston has started all kinds of new programs to get people involved in playing tennis, to get existing players playing different kinds of tennis. I think our uh, assistant city manager, Kathy Ball, was in one of the new programs there, the Tri-Tennis Program, and I think actually some other city employees were part of that too. So um, there's just a lot going on around tennis. It's, um, it, there's a lot of energy, and I hope you all are able to come to some of the Fed Cup events uh, when, it's, when it comes back uh, in less than a month. Where are we, three weeks out? Less than three weeks out. Okay, so here we go. Uh, whereas the international, oh, sorry, I also forgot to mention, last year the USTA um, actually granted the city of Asheville $35,000 to make improvements at Aston Park. Those improvements are underway, I believe. Uh, and if we, if we play those cards right, I think the hope is that they'll make another investment and legacy gift for us this year when they come. So. Whereas the International Tennis Federation and the United States Tennis Association are bringing Fed Cup back to Asheville on February 9th and 10th, 2019, to be played in the ExploreAsheville.com arena in the U.S. Cellular Center, with the United States competing against Australia, and whereas many of the world's best women professional tennis players from the U.S. and Australia will be competing in Asheville in order to advance to the semifinals, and whereas the U.S. Cellular Center manager Chris Coral, right here. Uh, I lost my place, has led the effort on behalf of the city of Asheville in securing the Fed Cup tie, and whereas the Asheville Buncombe Regional Sports Commission has played an integral role in the organization and administration of the local organizing committee, whereas the ABRSC and Fed Cup 2018 was awarded the Tennis Special Event of the Year by the Southern Tennis Association at their annual meeting in Atlanta on January 19th, and also presented the same award by the North Carolina Tennis Association at their annual meeting in Pinehurst on January 26th. And whereas the Asheville Tennis Association has recruited and trained over 150 volunteers for the upcoming Fed Cup, and the ATA was awarded the 2018 Community Tennis Association of the Year Award by both the STA and the NCTA. And whereas the Fed Cup has brought the tennis community together with unprecedented local sponsorships, community support, and back-to-back -back sellouts, and whereas all four major tennis facilities in Asheville, Aston Park Tennis Center, Asheville Racquet Club, Country Club of Asheville, and the Grove Park Inn are supporting Fed Cup with staff, staff volunteering for the Fed Cup, and whereas the sport of tennis is known as the sport for a lifetime for its health benefits and the fact that tennis players are known for playing well into their senior years, and now, therefore, I, Esther Mannheimer, mayor of the city of Asheville, North Carolina, do hereby pro proclaim that this city honors and recognizes the week of February 4th through 10th, 2019, as Celebrate Tennis Week in Asheville, and commend the incredible community collaboration and support of the Fed Cup 2019, the International Women's First Round Tie in Asheville. Thank you. On behalf of the Sports Commission and our local organizing committee, um, I'd like to thank each of you for your support of this event, and especially uh, Chris Coral and, and the U.S. Cellular Center staff. Uh, when you, uh, I'm Deb Bradford, Executive Director of the Asheville Buncombe Regional Sports Commission, and uh, you know, lightning struck the first time when we got this event. And, and everybody was surprised, Asheville. And now we're hosting it the second time. And it's because of each one of these individuals who give their time, their efforts to making our event special and our um, US Cellular Center. Uh, Chris and his staff do a tremendous job and we couldn't do, uh, host this event without his leadership. 
So we're looking forward to hosting it again. I think all of the accolades that we received from last year, including the award last weekend, uh, this past weekend in Atlanta, and going to Pinehurst this weekend, are just indicative of our local organizing community, community and all of the volunteers. Um, and I think probably we've talked about a legacy gift, but the most important thing that this event brought to Asheville last year was where over 500 of children participated in outreach clinics. And that includes all of our school, you know, different schools and our tennis community and our minority communities with the NJTL program. But the most incredible thing is this year, over 1,000 children will be impacted by the outreach events. And I think that's what the most important thing that this is gonna bring. No matter which player comes, we're gonna embrace this event, but the impact on our local community is what we're most proud of. We really wanna know if Serena and Venus are coming back. <laughs> You'll tell us as soon as you know, I'm sure. Okay. I'll text you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Um, okay, and the final proclamation, which isn't exactly a proclamation, is Duke Energy's 25th Annual Power Partner Award 2018 for Innovation and Sustainability. And I'll recognize Duke Energy's Jason Walls, who is here. And Jason, if you've got anyone else you need to bring up. No, what? not you alone is enough. That's enough. <laughs> so on, um, I guess it was about a week or so ago, we were able to, um, kind of recognize some of the work and partnership that um, that we've been doing over the last few years together and it was real exciting but um, Duke Energy is delighted to present the city of Asheville and Buncombe County jointly um, one of its power partner awards the power partner award dates back 25 years to 1992 and is a really competitive award in 2018 only six um, customers out of over 4,000 were selected for their excellence in some, um, some part of their priority. For Asheville and Buncombe County, it was an Excellence and Sustainability Award. It was a recognition through the innovation, the commitment, um, the kind of the stick to itness, we'll call it, of, um, of the spirit of this community that we were um, thrilled to recognize both the city and the county for um, its excellence in innovation and sustainability. So if you think about it, in 2016, we started, um, we started this party and with the creation of the Energy Innovation Task Force with three very basic um, goals. One was to avoid or delay building um, any more natural gas, or specifically a natural gas peaker plant, um, to fuel our community. To help promote and increase um, adoption of energy efficiency and demand side management programs and to create a culture of, um, of community engagement around this type of work. And today, through these efforts and others, it's exciting to see that um, the peaker plant that was forecasted in 2023 is now pushed out far beyond the 15 year planning horizon of the company. So the work is meaningful. What started as the Energy Innovation Task Force has actually turned into a, um, a growing, reputable brand locally, the Blue Horizons Project, which creates that platform for customers across our community and really across the region um, to connect with Duke Energy as well as this movement in energy innovation um, directly without having to connect with either the company, the city, or the county. And it's also making a big difference. We're seeing um, significant increases already in adoption of demand side management programs, which are the only programs that actually reduce your need to build peak power plants. Um, we're seeing increases in both residential and business energy efficiency products and services. And it's just an exciting time to be a part of this community. We're seeing more and more um, investments in solar and battery storage, and we've already announced um, 19 megawatts, which exceeds our original five megawatt target. Don't worry about the word megawatts. That's a great geeky engineering word. Just a <laughs> point, it's um, almost four times as much as we originally committed to, as well as solar. I had the opportunity um, to be in Hot Springs today, which is part of the electric system that serves Western North Carolina, where we will be building the state's first microgrid 
um, with connected with solar and um, battery storage pending approval of the North Carolina Utilities Commission. So without any further ado, um, I'm delighted to present, to present City, um, really I'll present this to City Council, but it's a recognition of all the work of the people who have been involved in this throughout the city with a 25th annual Power Partner Award 2018 of the City of Asheville for Innovation and Sustainability. Awesome. That's nice. It just stands. It just stands. Beautiful. <laughs> Turn it around. Show the <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah, and if I could just add a, a couple of words uh, to what Jason said, the, as I think the biggest point is this partnership that we launched two, I guess actually now three, almost three years ago, um, is making a difference, has made changes. It's a real thing. Uh, in addition to the battery storage and the microgrid project that Jason mentioned and all of the uh, additional signups for the demand side management programs, there are also dozens of homes have been weatherized uh, through this program. And uh, with the support of the Energy Innovation Task Force, uh, Duke uh, applied for approval of a brand new program at the Utilities Commission and received that approval um, that will fundamentally change the way that low-income weatherization pro programs happen around this state. will make it easier. It will, essentially, Duke will now be funding this work that is, that is largely supported now by nonprofits and local governments and federal dollars. So this, this, is a this, is a, this is a sea change for our lower income residents ac ac uh, across the state that will um, really expand the, the ability for them to have uh, safer, healthier, uh, and less expensive homes. I just want to share a quick story about the microgrid um, project that Jason mentioned. So Duke applied for approval from the Utilities Commission for this microgrid. And for folks who don't know that, that is a combination of solar energy and battery storage that helps then uh, sustain, uh, in this case, hot springs when the power goes out. Uh, for some period of time. And this is, this is truly the, the way that we are going to be moving in the future. It's part of a key part of the distributed energy system that we're going to need to develop. And this is the first one, as Jason said, in North Carolina. The Public Utilities Commission scheduled a hearing for it because they, they wanted to hear you know, all, the, all the sides and, and hear the opposition and hear the support. Um, just last week, they canceled that hearing because all they heard out of Asheville, if you can believe it or not, was support for Duke Energy in this application for a microgrid. Uh, and that was from groups as diverse as the Energy Innovation Task Force to the Sierra Club uh, and everybody in between. So this, is, this shows the power of when we can come together and do good things. We, we are pushing Duke Energy to do things differently. We have Duke Energy staff people here who are pushing their company to do things differently. And uh, the company is noticing. And this award is just one uh, example of the way in which they are noticing that we do things differently here in Asheville. And sometimes they're really, really good. So thank you again, Jason. OK, thank you. Um, so that concludes our proclamations. Uh, next, we have our consent agenda which is record breaking and how short it is, <laughs> amazing. Um, do I have any questions or comments for any items on the consent agenda or a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, if, is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion to approve the consent agenda? If so, please step forward. No? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, we have one presentation tonight is a review of budget priorities and community feedback and our CFO, Barbara Whitehorn, will make that presentation. Mayor, members of council, thank you very much. I'm Barbara Whitehorn, as you said, uh, Chief Financial Officer for the City of Asheville. And I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we did for some additional community outreach on the on the budget process and what we learned from that, what we gained from it, and how we'd like to move forward. So we're gonna go over a few things. Um, the goal of the project, process, benefits, lesson learned, 
potential improvements, and next steps. So the goal of the project was to improve community access to the budget process, improve staff understanding of, of the community priorities, and provide input for you all in your decision-making processes through, around the budget. The process and engagement um, was four community meetings. We gave a budget overview, and then we took the information from their neighborhood in the citizen survey and brought in staff related to the issues that had been identified in that survey so that we would have some additional resources. Um, additionally, we did the council education sessions, which you all obviously went through, and that was monthly budget discussions of the department budgets um, in a more detailed way. And then in addition to that, because we knew that our four community meetings wouldn't hit everybody, we did an online open city hall. So next I'm going to just review our citizen survey results a little so we have a place to start and you'll know where we started with the people that we engaged. So there's our, my little word art. Public <laughs> safety and the environment were the top citizen survey responses. And this was the statistically significant survey, um, the national citizen survey. So public safety was the highest concern with environmental protection second. And we just kind of go down the line with really the things that align with a lot of y'all's goals and that we've seen over the years. So our budget open city hall we had 79 respondents, so not statistically significant, but what we wanted to see was would we get different input from the people that wanted to speak to the budget than we did in a general citizen survey. So we took the priorities from the citizen survey and asked, do these priorities, do these budget priorities reflect your thoughts on what we should be focusing on? And we had 79 responses, about eight hours of public comment, um, and we left the response open-ended. We ended up with very similar responses. Um, environment beat out public safety slightly, but it was just about the same as the citizen survey, and then public transit, sidewalks, bikeways, greenways, infrastructure, on down the line. It was very, it was an interesting, um, Way to survey because it was open ended. I think um, that's something we may change going forward. But we did get um, a significant input on other priorities, including homelessness, mitigating the impact of tourism and development, um, ride share and alternative transit options, city employee pay, better paying jobs in the community, improving downtown parking and traffic congestion. And then we had a few people who talked about things they didn't like. Um, Kind of the same stuff, just don't prioritize these. So it was kind of it was it was really interesting. Um, the community input has been very valuable to staff in developing recommendations. Hopefully, it'll be valuable to you. Um, what we would really like to improve going forward is more inclusive community outreach. We'd like to do outreach that's a little more targeted for the people that are less likely to show up to the meetings, less likely to show up to use an online survey. Um, so our feedback at public meetings needs some more structure so that we're saying, here's a council priority, does this reflect what you want? A little more specific um, because we think that would be easier to compile and come up with the priorities. Um, we want to include some community education on the city's roles and limitations. Um, we had quite a few people talk about the, um, the gap in performance at schools, um, lots of, of health and human service comments that really apply more to the county. So we felt like we need to really educate people about what the city is supposed to do and what we're allowed to do by statute. And we really need to meet people where they are. And we feel that um, we could have done a better job at that and we can certainly going forward. So our potential strategies as we move into, and I know this sounds, we're halfway through fiscal year 19 and we're already working on planning for 2021 budget, but that's you know, how it works certainly in my role. Um, is to continue education um, and have more meaningful engagement. We want a more effective way of collecting input. 
We want to outreach to community leaders to try to really reach those parts of our community that aren't normally heard. Um, create additional meeting locations, in particular locations where we don't normally have meetings. Um, piggyback on existing community meetings. And the reason we're saying we want to do that now is because for us to make that happen, we have to start planning now. And that's really what we're doing, is planning that outreach to community leaders, identifying those key areas where people aren't necessarily being heard. And, and we want to hear everybody's input on the budget. We don't just want to hear from the people who can get here on a Tuesday evening. Um, so those are our potential strategies moving forward. And then I'm just gonna conclude with our budget calendar which is, of course, on the website and has, you know, the same details. Do y'all have questions, comments? All right. Thank you. Okay, that was our one uh, presentation for tonight. We have two items on our public hearings agenda, however. The first one needs to be tabled. I think this will be my first official motion to table anything, although the term is tossed around quite a bit, um, which means that when we're ready to consider it, we will have to take it off the table. But tonight I need a motion. <laughs> right, tonight I need a motion to table item A, a public hearing to consider an amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance making all subdivisions in historic overlay districts and on local historic landmark properties a major work. So do I have a motion to table that item? So moved. Okay. And do I have second? second? All right. Um, anyone wishing to comment on the motion to table item A? It will come back, but there is not a date yet for when it will come back. I'm not going to find the table. Yeah, and when we take it off the table. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> item B is a public hearing to consider conditional zoning of a portion of property located at 252 Patton Avenue and a portion of property located at 28 Knoxville Place from Central Business District and RM8 Residential Multifamily Medium Density District to Central Business District Expansion Conditional Zone to construct an electric utility substation. Shannon Tuck is here. This is super exciting. An electric utility substation. It Tell is, us about it. It is very exciting. Um, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Um, I literally was going to start off by saying it's exciting to be here this evening um, to present <laughs> this conditional zoning request. And it is exciting yeah, because- Yeah, we're not joking. This is serious. This is, yeah. We're excited about this. Um, this has been a work in progress for quite an extended period of time. And at this point, I think we're probably going on about close to two years that we have been discussing the substation at this site. Um, but this has been time well spent because uh, it has culminated in a community supported plan for this electric utility substation. So that might not sound very dramatic, but I'm going to let that soak in for a minute. This is a community supported plan for an electric utility substation. So in the planning world, we always strive for a successful public engagement process. Um, but this successful collaboration, I think, is largely thanks to the willingness of both the Duke Energy and the community members who are most significantly impacted by this proposal to sit down and identify first common goals and then to work through a variety of design options that has resulted in the plans that are before you this evening. So to begin, um, I'll orient you to the site. The property is located on the corner of Clingman and Patton Avenue. Um, it is the, the the, the majority of the property is located at 252 Patton. It does include a small portion of this lot, this residential lot located off of Knoxville Place. It is, however, only a portion of those two lots. And the recombination plat that was included in your packets probably better illustrates the subject property. And as you can see, it's just a portion of the larger commercial property located at 252, as well as just a little piece of that residential parcel off of Knoxville Place. Um, the property, the subject property, has frontage on both West Haywood Place and Knoxville, excuse me, West Haywood Street and Knoxville Place. However, access to the substation will come through this private drive located off of uh, Clingman Avenue to the east. For a little additional context, um, you can see from the aerial, the site is the former Hunter Volvo property, and as part of this proposal, 
Um, the applicant has already secured a demolition permit to remove the building and the surface parking that surrounds the site. So in addition to preparing the substation property, the applicant, who also owns these three additional residential properties off of Knoxville, um, will prepare the entire property for future redevelopment, um, and that would be for private development in the downtown. And you can see here on the site plan, the, those, that additional property um, are identified as lots two and three on the recombination plat. And so you can see that, that a majority of the site will be held in abeyance for that future development. That is not part of the conditional zoning that's being considered this evening. However, it's important because when that future property gets developed, it will help screen and minimize the impact of the substation property. And that's particularly important because this is a key property. It's one of our gateway properties into our downtown. So minimizing the impact of that substation is very valuable. The plan includes, so you can see here, the area outlined in red is the subject of the conditional zoning, and this is the substation um, itself. So the plan is for a single story, 5,200 square foot um, building that will enclose the uh, switch gear for the substation. And then there's an additional outdoor area that will be screened on all sides except for the roof. The roof will be open to allow for some additional air movement. Around the substation will be a clear area and the entire site will be enclosed with a security fence. Um, between, the subs or between the security fence and the road frontages will just be sort of open grassed uh, area and um, there will be street trees both along West Haywood Street and Knoxville Place. Also along West Haywood we will have a new 12 foot wide sidewalk as part of this project and street trees and street grates. There's also an ornamental iron wall, or excuse me, iron fence that will be along West Haywood. Um, I should point out that in addition to the, the one-story substation um, that is being modified as part of the conditional zoning um, for the building itself being one story, um, the property is also um, seeking a modification for the setback from uh, both Haywood Street and Knoxville Place. And I should probably back up for just a moment and explain that the purpose of the conditional zoning tonight um, is essentially uh, necessitated because Duke has agreed to do a gas insulated switch gear substation. So that gets enclosed inside a building and due to the operational needs of a substation, it is um, uh, impractical to apply all of the same development standards that we would apply to normal downtown construction. Um, so the conditional zoning process allows us to modify some of those downtown design requirements. So in addition to those modifications, um, you can see here too from the building elevations, the one story height. However, the building does um, have some height to it. Uh, there is a basement level, and so uh, depending on the perspective view into the property, the building has sort of an appearance of a one and a half story, maybe two story building, depending on your view. Um, the proposal also modifies some of the fenestration and glazing requirements. Uh, although the design does incorporate a fair amount of openings, um, and between the design elements, along with the materials that are being proposed, the brick, the metal, the translucent panels, uh, it kind of give, provides character of a public service or um, public utility building, um, which is appropriate given the, the proposed use. <coughs> the perspective, the applicant has also prepared a number of perspective drawings that I think are helpful, not only because they give you a better idea of the, the character of the building and the design of the building, but in addition to the building itself, there is some external electrical infrastructure that will be included in this proposal, and the elevations kind of help illustrate some of what you might expect to see. So you've got some very tall um, poles on the outside of the building. Um, you can see the streetscape along West Haywood here. And you can see, particularly in this view, the balance of that property that's going to be left open and that will be developed at some point in the future after the substation becomes operational. So again, as this property gets developed, the view into that substation property is going to be 
um, further eclipsed. Another view, um, the West Haywood Street side is going to be the most visible side. So this is one perspective view kind of looking towards the downtown. And again, you can see some of that uh, additional poles, some of that additional infrastructure that will be part of the substation. Um, you can see that ornamental uh, iron fence and just a little corner of the, the streetscape pattern that's going to be established. Look in the other direction from Haywood Street. Again, that's going to be the most visible view into the substation property. And again, you see um, just the scale of some of that infrastructure as it compares to the building itself. And again, some elevations <coughs> to better illustrate that additional infrastructure um, compared to the building. This is the west elevation and then the east elevation. The Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed this proposal at their December 5th meeting, and prior to that, the Downtown Commission reviewed it as well. Um, both commissions voted in unanimous support of the project. That concludes my introduction. I'd be happy to answer any questions, or Mr. Walls and his design team are here also to, I'm sure, say a few things. Um, does anyone have any questions for Shannon? All right, Jason, do you all wanna make any comments on this? Anybody? Mayor, I think we're here to answer your questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> one question. Of Shannon or of Jason? Of Jason. Okay. So, Jason, can, can you, you know, for um, a lay person, explain the difference between a gas insulated substation and, and a any other kind right. of substation? So I have two guys sitting back there that are probably better equipped. They like that, can't wait to come um, home. Okay. So essentially the air serves as the insulation. So when you have a lot of electrical components, you don't want them to arc um, between themselves. So the air insulated substations have to be a lot further apart so that no arcing occurs. The gas insulated is, um, is actually insulated by um, a gas and it's enclosed. So it's, it doesn't require as much space. So a gas insulated substation was um, appropriate here because we were able to go from a really large, um, a need for a really large property to a relatively small property. But it's about the insulation that's needed to keep the, um, to keep the electrical opponents insulated from one another. So, so to point out this is fairly significant because you, you know the large footprint is now greatly reduced because it's a gas insulated. Also it's fully enclosed in a building unlike a typical substation. And it, it is more costly, though. Do, yes. you, you, do you have an idea of what the cost difference is? So, you know, we're still kind of going through a lot of that budgeting stuff, so we don't know the cost difference. We do know that um, the site is large enough to where um, leveraging those two um, kind of out parcels will allow us to sell that back into the market to help, um, um, help not fully them. cover, but help certainly offset the cost, of the increased cost of technology. And, and where else um, in the state would we find a gas insulated substation? So there are, um, there's a gas insulated substation in Chapel Hill um, that was put in place a long time ago, which is a kind of a, um, kind of a partnership between Chapel Hill and um, Duke Energy that was done a long time ago. But this will really be the first one in the state that um, Duke Energy Progress has, um, has built and um, installed in their system. No, no, I, no, but um, thank you for being so creative about that. And, and that's actually what I wanted to come up and say, and I know that I could have saved this to public hearing, but since I was recognized, you know, I, I just have to kind of tip my hat to the community um, that, that is surrounding this site. Um, you know, we have been at this now, I've been in Asheville for six years, and um, this was the first thing that I started looking at, looking into when I moved here in 2013. Um, and after, um, peaks and valleys in the process, we'll call it. Um, the weekend neighborhood um, and, and others came to the table in good faith, um, trusting a, at times a difficult process. Um, and we got to a point where um, I think that we all feel good with not only the result, but the process in which we use to get to the result. And so um, I just, I personally want to say on the record um, how delighted I am for the friends that I've made in this process, the commitment that they had, as well as the willingness um, that they showed throughout this entire process to, um, to help us come up with a solution that fits. 
um, Asheville. Yeah. Well, and I want to thank um, I want to thank Duke Energy for working with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we um, this has been an incredible learning experience. When it all started, we were looking at three potential sites. One of them was next to Isaac Dixon. Uh, Thanks for bringing that not, up. Which, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah, I think that was one of the valleys. That. that was one of the valleys. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember a, a gym full of maybe around 600 people who were mm -hmm. not okay with that choice. So to, to work with the community to um, redirect the direction and to become so innovative is an incredible uh, testament to your company's willingness to, to work with us on this one. And the community to stick in there. And I know I see a lot of people here and I know you've been to a million meetings, so I really I really appreciate all the effort that's gone into this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna open the public hearing on this item before we have a motion. So if you would like to speak on this item, you will need to state your name and you'll have three minutes. So is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Wow, this isn't how I thought that's it That's exciting. Yeah, I'd say several it's years weird. ago, I didn't think it was gonna go like this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? I'll, I'll make it, go ahead. I move to, appro to approve the conditional zoning request from Central Business District in residential multifamily, medium density to Central Business District conditional zone to allow for the construction of a 5,200 square foot one-story gas insulated substation and find that the request is reasonable is in the public interest and is consistent with the comprehensive plan in that the project one <laughs> minimizes land use impacts through innovative design two utilize the thorough public input and community engagement process and three provides a critical service need in an area targeted for significant growth second all right we have a motion and a second any other comments before we vote all, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes our public hearings agenda for the evening, but we have one item of unfinished business that is a never ending piece of unfinished business. Consideration to support option one as the next steps in the Haywood Page redevelopment planning. And I have here that Todd, there he is, Todd Okla Cheney, our planning director, is going to speak on this item. I'm not sure I need a map for this site, but just in case. <laughs> Where are we talking about? Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, in March 2017, Council approved a vision report for city-owned properties located on Haywood Street and Page Avenue in downtown Asheville. The visioning process was facilitated by the Asheville Design Center, who worked with an advisory team, uh, many of whom are in the audience tonight. Uh, consisting of representatives from various organizations and other stakeholders. The subject properties uh, comprise approximately uh, three quarters of an acre. They're highlighted in yellow on this map and the surrounding study area also included another approximately one and a half acres. In September of 2017, City Council directed staff to, to pursue an RFQ for professional services for conceptual design options and a preferred plan for these properties and surrounding area based on that visioning report. Staff issued the RFQ and worked with representatives from the advisory team to review qualifications submitted by consultant groups from around the country. Planning and urban design staff had been in negotiations with the highest ranked consultant team led by Nelson and Bird, Nelson Bird Woltz landscape architects for design services and other work intended to inform the long-term use of these properties. The proposed scope of work included design options supported by programming and economic feasibility and a maintenance regime for the long-term success of those properties, as well as cost estimates for the design options, community engagement, and engineering and transportation analyses. So you, as you can see from the proposed scope of services, uh, it did the work did not just include design options, but all this other work to help inform the potential long-term use of those properties. After an initial round of negotiations with the top-ranked team, the proposed scope of work totaled approximately $324,000, with an additional $16,000 anticipated for a new survey of the properties. And to date, no funding has been identified. In December of 2018, staff presented four options to the Planning and Economic Development Committee to move the project forward. 
The preferred option by staff and the committee, called option one, includes a multi-year funding request to hire the Nelson Bird Woltz team and that money to be spread over the current and next fiscal years. The PED committee then recommended that this item come before the full council tonight to consider a resolution to authorize the city manager to pursue a multi-year funding strategy for this project. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions about that preferred option or any of the other options that were discussed at uh, the PED committee <coughs> back in December. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Or a motion? Oh, you, you're you not going to do public comment? Yep, this one is a unfinished business, so I need a motion first. Okay, um, I'll make the motion, I guess. I'll I'll move move, I move, that I'll do it. I move to adopt a resolution authorizing city manager to identify a multi-year funding strategy to complete the site design implementation plan for city-owned properties on Haywood Street and Page Avenue. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. And before we vote, can I just say one thing? So at, at uh, what was that today? Finance committee? Yeah. Um, uh, we had a conversation about funding something completely different, um, but in, that, in the context of that conversation, uh, it, we learned that the city has a little over about $114,000 available from the sale of a piece of property that was going to be put sort of toward affordable housing or um, not, a study related to affordable housing. And um, I just want to I said there, and I just want to say here that if, if that money doesn't have to go into that pot where we already have designated monies for affordable housing um, a lot right now, uh, that, that, that the city staff consider using that, those proceeds to at least fund a portion of this. Um, so just flagging that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. If there's anyone wishing to comment on the motion. Yes. Mr. Nutter will show us how this is done. We'll state your name. You'll have three minutes. Oh, okay, we're gonna line up. Uh, you know, I have a number of people that signed up to speak for that. this. So I can call people who signed up in the order they signed up. Is that all right? All right, so if everyone will sit down before our firefighters take you out of the aisle. Um, I'll just call those who have signed up, and then we'll get it. If you haven't signed up, then we'll then we'll call you after that. Should I sit back down? No, you're you're gonna you're demonstrating. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> yes. Mayor, council, and city manager. My name is Dave Nutter. I'm a local citizen committed to this project and a city planner of half a century's experience. I ask you to support the hard-fought progress of the Haywood and Page project by, adoption, uh, by adopting option number one recommended by the Department of Planning and Urban Design. This will fund a master plan for a key city property in the center of Asheville. 68 Haywood had a turbulent beginning, but we have made remarkable progress. Its revitalization is important for our city, for its amazing set of create, uh, creative neighboring uses for citizens and residents to the four corners of Asheville and for civic engagement within our community. For 10 years, I have studied this prominent site with the Asheville Design Center, the Haywood Street Visioning Team as a parishioner at the St. Lawrence Basilica and as a member of the city's consultant selection committee, which selected the Nelson Bird Wolves team. That team is working with Riverlink to plan the Karen Cragnolan Park on the French Broad River. Their work is excellent and their method of inclusive public engagement is exceptional. Their selection and contract negotiations requires $340,000 for the work. The staff report recommends splitting that sum between two fiscal years the Planning and Economic Development Committee approved this option unanimously. We strongly support the visionary idea of a prominent open space at this location, one that will be a matter of community pride, create goodwill, increase the public trust, serve all neighbors, citizens, and visitors, 
and include supporting educational and economic uses as a just and inclusive place for all. 68 Haywood is a city property, and I ask you to approve option one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I believe Wanda Lovejoy is signed up to speak about this. Is this correct? Okay, all right. is all the people who worked on making this a green spot in the city. And um, I think well, she's not coming up. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was the uh, gatekeeper. You know, I opened the garden every morning, and I'm a photographer, so I took pictures, which will be coming up. But these are all the people that, um, you know, worked on the garden, made the garden happen. And I have a book here that signed from people this summer, this season, who uh, visited our garden from all over the world. And everybody says the same thing, that they loved it, they thought it was a great, um, from Paris, but, you know, Italy, um, all over different states. Um, people, you know, uh, worked real hard, um, you know, bringing stuff in, bringing dirt in and uh, you know, making this a, a wonderful you know, green spot in the middle of downtown. And I can pass this book around if you'd like to see some of the quotes. Oh, you think, yes. And this, these are some of the people that worked, you know, growing herbs and uh, putting water in because we did not have running water the first year they did this, but we did get water put in this year, like a you know, pump, so we could water everything. And um, my, my pictures are coming up, so this is taken by um, uh, Claire, Anna, of all the people that were in the garden. There she is. <laughs> Yeah. And it's it's just been great. We have a handy we have part of the garden that is just for people in wheelchairs that have been able to garden and and grow you know uh, things, and um, it made them happy because people in wheelchairs to get to garden and put their hands in the soil again was really good for their their psyche and their overall well being. And. Uh, we just hope that the, the garden is able to, you know, stay. This is um, everybody, and I think the uh, pictures of the garden um, are coming up. We had an International Day of Peace in September. That was, you know, there was a lot of veterans and people there. And um, this, this was uh, everybody, this is one of the people in the wheelchairs that we built her a higher box so she could you know, garden, and she grew vegetables and a couple of flowers. That's me buying some flowers for the garden. Oop. You can leave, a, I think, if you want to leave the pictures continuing to rotate, and the next speaker is Claire Henderhan. So. Yeah, okay. It's Claire. Claire, have you up next uh, signed up to speak? Yes. I want the, one, the other set of pictures. Thank you. Wanda did a wonderful job in presenting the PowerPoint about the faces of our garden, the many people whose hands and hearts make that garden happen. The next, we want a different one, the yeah, one, yeah. okay. Now we're gonna to present to you the beauty of the garden uh, where the many people cultivated. 
As you know, hello everyone. As you know, we're a little nervous and backwards here, but yes, this is it. And, and this will just show you some of the absolute beauty that can be cultivated. Do I have to? Thank you for bearing with us. We're a little nervous. Um, but it's real important to us that we who live in the neighborhood have access to the earth. The city opened up the gates of a gravel block to us. Okay. Go ahead. I'll see if I can get it going. These are the most lovely pictures. Uh, we're the bee city. And you know, the, the, the hum of the bees is the voice of the garden, they say, and the faces of the people who create the garden, who put their labor and love, the thousands of volunteer hours that have come our way. Um, and we can let this run while others of our gardeners very, very speak. Well. But this is our great photographer, Wanda Lovejoy, and, and she has uh, created all of these were grown in our garden on the gravel lot that used to be the building on 33 Page Avenue. We are the first of the Asheville Edibles yeah. Community Gardens. And uh, on a wing and a prayer, we've gotten, I wrote a grant for $1,000 with the Pollinator Fund, and we got that. And then the Bountiful Cities Community Garden Network gave us about 900, give or take. And another 900 or so came from dollar bills put in their donation box over the years by individuals coming to our garden. And this is the beauty that can be created when the city sort of opens the gates and lets the neighbors show what we can do on a wing and a prayer with determination and love. And thank you to um, Asheville for waiving the spigot fee so that we now have water. We were carrying our water by hand. Um, now we can spray it with a hose. And the donations that come in usually pay for the water. What we're asking, what we are asking, is that Elder and Sage Community Gardens be an integral component of any design that is created for these spaces. Uh, that we live there, it's our neighborhood, it's our home place. And for many of us, we can't go very far. Many of us don't have uh, cars. Um, we have made this place beautiful for the city and we want to continue doing so. So that's all I need to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's just a few words. I made it under three minutes. <laughs> different, you know, different stages as things started growing and blooming. I think this is from when the, we were first starting this season. And that was the very beginning. I guess it came out like that. The herb garden was really a labor of love. A lot of people, you're able to pick fresh herbs that you need to cook with. It was really <coughs> wonderful. And I would sometimes when the tourists would come, they're in their hotels, I would pick them chamomile or mint to have with their part of Asheville with all their you know, visiting here. And that's the whole gang, I think. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next person I've signed up to speak on this item is David Johnson. Uh, thank you very much for <coughs> permitting, per per permitting me to speak tonight. My name is David Johnson. I'm a retired planner and professor emeritus at the University of Tennessee. I'm also a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I was director of the School of Planning at UT for seven years, and I served on the design team for the Tennessee Bicentennial Mall at the State Capitol in Nashville. I have seen firsthand the power of well-designed public open spaces to revitalize a city. I first came to Asheville 55 years ago, and I've been a resident here for the last 20 years. Uh, I've watched Asheville change, mostly, but not always for the better. I'm speaking today as a private citizen who has children and grandchildren who live here. One of my ch children <laughs> is in the audience. Uh, I'd like to make two points. First, don't miss this incredible opportunity to create a new public space 
in this strategic site, bordered by the glorious St. Lawrence Basilica, the Grove Arcade, and the Civic Center, and our main library. Uh, these opportunities don't come along every day for every city. And there are precedents here in Asheville. We all know Pritchard Park as a park space. But it wasn't always so. It was the site of the old post office, which when demolished 100 years ago, was wisely converted by the city into a vest pocket park. Who can now imagine downtown without Pritchard Park? My second point is this, get the best design talent you can to create a public open space for all the people of Asheville. We know this is a difficult site to plan for, but a good design team can turn obstacles into assets and knows how to connect the site to surrounding uses. There are a handful of firms that can do this well. Uh, Nelson Boy, Bird Waltz is one of those firms. I know their work to be thoughtful and professional. They recently released design for the future Karen Cragnolan Riverfront Park is an example. It is sensitive to the site and surroundings and is cost conscious uh, in its design. To sum up, don't miss this opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity. And secondly, find the best design talent you can. I strongly urge you to embrace the recommendations of the Planning and Economic Development Committee. Make this happen, and our grandchildren will thank you. Um, the next person I've signed up to speak on this item is David Matt. Mayor, council members. My name is David Madden. I live in Black Mountain. Please excuse the informality of my dress. I came dressed for the Arctic, but uh, things are a lot better now. The, the air is on. Uh, I am chair uh, and creator of the uh, Guast uh, Raphael Guastavino Palaces for the People Alliance. Alliance of all of the places where uh, Raphael Guastavino and his son created domes and vaults and employed a unique method of tiling. Um, I come tonight to ask you to consider uh, allotting some space uh, to a small museum. I say small because we already have the elements uh, that could go into it from an exhibition uh, that opened in Boston, in Boston Public Library, which was Guastavino Sr.'s first project, and moved to Washington, and moved to New York, and the curator, uh, knowing that we wanted to create a museum at Christ Mount at that time, which is where his estate is, said, I'll give you these panels and the various materials of the exhibition. We looked all over Asheville. He wanted to be in Asheville. Looked all over uh, Asheville, but they're so tall that we couldn't find the space. John McKibben said, you can take the lobby of the BB&T building, but it was too low. So I took it to Black Mountain, to a tiny museum in Black Mountain. We attracted 10,000 visitors from Asheville and all around the state and foreign countries and took in about $10,000 worth of uh, donations for the sake of the, uh, the little museum, uh, the Swannanoa Valley Museum. So uh, I still would like to consider, we would like to consider uh, a place in Asheville and the most obvious place would be across the street from his last project. Uh, I visited his first project in Barcelona and talked to the people who restored the theater that he built as his first uh, project. And he said, we are the first and you are the last because his last project was the Basilica. Uh, he was brought here by Vanderbilt to work on uh, tiling and to create vaulting and to create domes. The dome across the, uh, uh, across uh, from this property we're discussing uh, is the largest uh, elliptical dome in, uh, in uh, uh, eastern 
America. So it's, we have a unique situation here, and I hope you'll consider that. Uh, the next person I have signed up to speak is Amber Banks. Hello, thanks for letting me talk. Um, briefly, I didn't write anything down. Um, I think Elder and Sage is very unique. I think it's great to have nature and have community be a part of it and I don't see any reason why that can't be integrated with, with whoever you choose whatever whatever goes on the lots but I really feel like that's super super important um, and it, again it's just one of a kind and it came out of nowhere the pit of despair and they made it happen and I guess that's it thank you um, Chris Joyell. Thank you, Mayor, Council, City Manager Campbell. Uh, my name is Chris Joyell. I'm the director of the Asheville Design Center, which helped facilitate uh, the Haywood Advisory Team in 2016 and 17 to develop a vision for 68 Haywood. Uh, I'm here today to encourage you to honor the advisory team's vision and secure the services of Nelson Bird Waltz to develop designs for the site. Uh, the advisory team members dedicated over a thousand volunteer hours to build consensus around a vision for 68 Haywood. And in, in addition, ADC volunteers volunteered uh, or uh, dedicated another thousand hours of their time uh, to the effort. And as we know, visions have a, a shelf life. So uh, I fear that if we delay any longer, that vision that the advisory team developed will begin to grow stale. And, uh, and I can promise you, nobody wants to do this all over again. <laughs> um, or at least I don't. Um, so, uh, so let's develop a range of... <laughs> Just a little. A little hint. <laughs> well, maybe I would. No, I wouldn't. Uh, so let's develop a range of, uh, of design options that can bring this vision to, uh, to life. I think the time is now, and I urge you to support this resolution. Thank you. We hear a similar uh, sentiment from our short-term rental task force. but. Yes. <laughs> um, that, that, uh, those are the folks I have signed up to speak on this, but if there's anyone else who would like to speak, please raise your hand. Yes. And the, we'll start, well, yep, either, however you all. Yeah. Okay, you'll be next in the back. Um, again, state your name. You'll have three minutes and watch the lights on the lectern. They let you know green means go, orange means you're getting close, and red means stop. Okay, good. Uh, good evening. Mayor Manheimer, Manager Campbell, and council members. My name is Mary Everest, and I am president of the board of the Basilica Preservation Fund. We are a 501c3 tasked with developing and implementing a comprehensive restoration and preservation plan for Rafael Guastafino's greater, greatest and final masterpiece, the Basilica of St. Lawrence. As you may know, in addition to being a diverse and thriving faith community, and an active social welfare presence downtown, the Basilica is one of Asheville's most popular tourist attractions and one of the largest landowners owners in the north end of downtown. As we explore the optimum use of church property, the Basilica welcomes dialogue with the city, local businesses, and our fellow landowners. We encourage and support a decision by city council this evening to assemble the funds necessary to hire Nelson Bird Woltz and move forward with the master plan. We are willing and able to enter into discussions with Nelson Bird Woltz on how best to incorporate the church campus into the overall master plan, and we look forward to substantive, comprehensive communication and collaboration with all parties involved. We ask city leadership this evening to capitalize on the incredibly unique opportunity before us, because with proper creativity, cooperation and collaboration between the church, the city, and our fellow landowners. Together we can renovate and transform the area around 68 Haywood Street and the Basilica into a vibrant, economically thriving, visually stunning focal point. Please take the first step this evening and allocate the funds needed to hire Nelson Bird -Waltz. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman in the back, I believe, was next in the very back row.
Thank you all of the City Council for the opportunity that I may speak in favor of securing funding for the next steps in the Haywood Page Redevelopment Project. My name is Craig Klein. I'm a retired architect and an HRC commissioner on the advisory panel for the Thomas Wolf Cabin Project. The Wolf Project is similar in scope and the need for land use analysis to the Haywood Page Project. For the Wolf Project, the city has now contracted with a very capable architectural firm of Lord Act Sargent, and I'm happy to report the Wolf Project has had its kickoff meeting and is off to a wonderful, organized beginning. By commissioning the services of Nelson Bird Waltz Landscape Architects, the city will have the opportunity to fully optimize every applicable element recommended by Asheville's Design Center's Haywood and Page Visioning Project. Good design benefits all citizens as its aim is directed towards the common good. Thus, it must be inclusive to each person that experiences the revitalized Haywood site. Nearby residents, daily workers, and tourists should all discover an accommodating site in, a, in their own unique way. Everyone should be delighted to find a unified, well-conceived use of space and enjoy the pleasure and convenience of a safe passage through this gateway site. Consider the pedestrian that may stroll from Charles Parker's Neo-Gothic Grove Arcade past the dignified and historic Basilica of St. Lawrence, past the event arenas with attendees spilling out and down Haywood Street, lined with shops. We all know currently there is much room for multimodal traffic circulation improvement at this site. To close, it is in the spirit of preserving and uniting Asheville's heritage of good architectural design, as seen in the works of Richard Morris Hunt, Frederick Law Olmsted, Richard Sharp Smith, Raphael Gustavino, grand masters of their trades, and I petitioned the city of Asheville to seek funding for plans by Nelson Bird Waltz for this important public space. Thank you. Billy back. Next, in the not so way My name is Roy Harris, and I've been a resident of Asheville now for 35 years. I've lived in the city limits from the day I arrived in Asheville uh, out at Turtle Creek, and then I moved into the city and, and purchased a home, which now I own. What I want to say is that as I was sitting back there, this site offers us great potential. You saw me looking up at these pictures here. And what I was seeing in them is the Native American side of me. But I want to also see the African American side. And so maybe somewhere in this site, we can do it. It's open. I go up and down the street all the time. And this is one of my favorite corners in Asheville. I support the Eldon Sage Garden there. And if that disappeared, I would be highly upset because I spent a lot of time just in that garden and also supporting what happens in that garden. I would have never thought that 51 years from now when I walked away from my father in our garden in the eastern part of North Carolina, that I would be up here lobbying for a garden site, but I'm doing it. So let's use this as an opportunity to take care of some things that we want to take care of. Maybe an African-American monument or maybe an African-American part in there. Keep the garden. There's always going to be a garden there some kind of way. Because I believe in the individuals that Elder and Sage, they're going to figure out a way to do it. I don't know how, but they will figure out a way to do it. Even if you get things in this site here, that doesn't say that Elder and Sage could not be the people that take care of all the places around there that has vegetation and those kinds of things. So thank you for entertaining me tonight. And as I walk, here and I see that side of me, I want to see the other side of me somewhere in this city. 
It's already there. The three sisters have been planted in the elder and sage garden, which represented. So keep up the good work, and I'll be back. Thank you. I think I have a gentleman over here. Mayor Mannheimer, Council, uh, as a supporter of the overall project on this site and as a volunteer in the Elder and Sage Garden, I have a few words I'd like to um, speak to you. Winston Churchill is often misquoted these days as saying, when asked about funding for the arts during World War II, if we don't support the arts, then what is it that we're fighting for? A little research reveals that, although attributed to Churchill, the quote actually seems to have originated a few years back in an article uh, from the Village Voice. Regardless of the origins or author of the quote, it is still a sentiment worthy of consideration and pertinent to my point. So to paraphrase the mistaken quote, I say without parks, without gardens and quiet green spaces, without a touch of nature and artistically designed public spaces, what is it that we're planning for? There is, located in the southwest corner of the property under consideration, the Elder and Sage Community Garden. This garden, which operates with the city's blessings and the good work of several dedicated volunteers, is a rare jewel, a diamond in the rough, as they say, and a must-visit space within our city's downtown area. I've spent more than a few hours there, soaking up the sunshine, surrounded by the beautiful vegetable plants, flowers, and interesting pieces of homemade folk art that have been carefully installed on the site by many fine and interesting people. I would like to acknowledge those volunteers who gave time, money, and energy from the heart in creating this magical little piece of ground known as the Elder and Sage Community Garden. Having been a professional gardener for much of my life, I've had the pleasure of traveling to and working in many beautiful and amazing gardens. For all that I've seen from the tropical gardens of Hawaii to the grounds of the Biltmore State, the Elder and Sage Community Garden stands out for its creative spirit and its grassroots community efforts. It has evolved from a graveled eyesore to become a space filled with peace, beauty, and light the opportunity for interacting with both locals and tourists alike as they pass through the garden has been most pleasing and very rewarding. I hope that each of you has taken the time to visit the garden, perhaps on a cool summer morning or on some fine autumn afternoon when the golden light brings out the best in the greenery, the colorful flowers and the comforting views to the north and to the east. This is a wonderful place for enjoying life while striking up conversations with the locals who live nearby or occasionally with the more adventurous tourists that have stepped off the well-used trail for a slice of natural beauty. Uh, I'm sorry I don't get to finish my thing here, but uh, anyway, I hope you will support the gardens. Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Scott Ong. <laughs> Uh, my name is Rachel Bliss, and uh, I hope all of you got the letter I sent you earlier this week about my, um, my being in favor of option one and funding it over the two-year period that we were talking about. I also feel honored tonight to have been here as racial healing came up because I believe in our garden the Elder and Sage Community Garden, we have healing there. We have people of different races involved, people of different ages. It's not all elders, but there are 
people across the gamut of, of work that is going on there. Um, I come as a member of the visioning committee. I come as the uh, founder and director of WNC for Peace. I'm a volunteer. I have a little garden space there and uh, grew a great crop of peas last year and uh, onions. And, you know, this is also a component of food security. We um, know that we have a food policy council here in Asheville. And a lot of the people at Vanderbilt and Battery, we have a threat of food insecurity. We have one man over there who has many different types of peppers in his one little raised bed. And he uh, uses those peppers in, to serve meals to other people. We have many examples. We, we saw some great pictures of flowers. And I like flowers just like anybody else. But if you could see all the vegetables and all the people who are pampering those vegetables, because they want to eat them. And so, you know, I have great respect for all the people who've come here today and have talked about museums and developing a beautiful spot. And one of the most beautiful spots we can ever have is a garden. And uh, I'm in favor of it as well because we planted a peace pole right in the middle of the garden. And considering many of the struggles that we've had in Asheville in recent years, I want that peace pole to signify that we are an international city of peace. We were declared one in 2016 by the International Cities of Peace Committee. And that would be a great way to show that we want to be at peace with one another, peace in our soul, and peace in the outer world because we have so many tourists. We want to show them that when they come to Asheville, this is a time when they can be at peace. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Yeah. I think he's just getting off of it. Uh, my name is Andrew Fletcher. I was the uh, chair of the Haywood Page um, uh, team that put together the vision report that got us here. I was then um, on the scoring team that helped score for um, the RFQ process that led to Nelson Bird Waltz being chosen. Um, during my time as chair, I was uh, trying to imagine that future that a design firm was going to come in here and that we were going to get an excellent top-notch design firm. Uh, when I saw Nelson Bird Waltz's submission and their uh, previous work, their approach to the work, I said, "That's those are the people." I said, "I said they're going to win." I mean, and uh, and they sure did. Everyone was everyone was convinced that they do a great job, and uh, so I really want to say that this moment is this strange convergence where everyone has asked you to do the same thing on this topic, <laughs> and for perhaps the first time, hopefully not the only time, but. Um, from all the sides of the argument have been funneled to this point where we're asking you to take action um, and fund and fund this and send it forward. And um, I think that's a really powerful moment. So, and and I, I, uh, I'm going to say thank you because I think you're about to do the right thing. And uh, um, I look forward to um, seeing how this, pro how this uh, pro uh, project develops further in the future. Um, and I, I believe that we've finally gotten over the political rancor that left this project um, in, its, in its status quo for so many years. And we get to move forward uh, in filling this missing uh, tooth in the smile of Asheville, finally. So thank you all. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Okay, we um, we have an opportunity here for a motion, and I do um, I do want to say that I appreciate the celebration of this rare synergy, this moment. I think uh, just interestingly, we have two items tonight that we've been considering that really started in a super contentious place. Not to say that this might, you know, not get contentious once again, but. Um, <clears throat> But I, but I 
I don't think it's often reported when we do finally through through a community collaborative process come to a place where we can have pretty close to uh, unanimity around something so that to me is quite an accomplishment tonight I'm, I'm we're here for about to have for the second time so that's great we have a motion do you, you want to make the motion you've got it up there. it's already been made and seconded it's already been made and seconded that's right because <laughs> we're not in the public hearing agenda portion all right any other questions or comments thank you for reminding me that was a long one so um all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed all right thank you if you want to stay for the noise ordinance, you are welcome to. But if you don't, this is your opportunity to make your getaway. Quietly. What? Oh. Are we, do we have a closed session? We do have a closed session. Okay, uh, Haywood Street people, make your way out into the hallway, continue your chatting, head over to Pax Tavern, whatever. actually pretty old old business but new new tonight an ordinance admitting provisions of chapter 10 article 4 of the code of ordinances of the city of Asheville concerning noise regulation and our assistant city attorney John Maddox is here to discuss this with us thank you mayor and members of council um, so my name is John Maddox I'm assistant city attorney um, before you tonight is a uh, amendment to the city's noise ordinances it's a actually a number of regulations, not a single ordinance, but a number of ordinances. Um, first, a little bit of background on our noise ordinance. This has been around um, in this form since roughly 1998, 2000, with some very significant changes to the city's noise ordinance. Um, the city has a fairly uh, subjective standard when it comes to what constitutes a noise disturbance. That right now is probably a noise disturbance in the hallway. Um, <laughs> Subjectively, according to me sitting up. Okay, the, I'm going to um, know. I think the, the zoning podium. allows it. Mm. So, under the city's noise ordinance, um, someone um, creating noise on their property, um, they're not allowed to create a noise disturbance, which is defined by our code as uh, an action, with noise which endangers or injures the health or safety of humans or animals, endangers or injures a personal or real property, or disturbs a reasonable person of normal sensitivity. It's a, it's a pretty subjective standard. Um, in order to determine whether a certain noise rises to the level of violation, um, the noise uh, has to be evaluated by whoever is doing the listening. The, typically, in Asheville, it's going to be the police officer who's doing that. They get called to the scene, and they have to evaluate a number of factors, whether the noise occurred during the daytime or nighttime, the proximity to residential areas, the nature and zoning of the area, whether it's recurrent, intermittent, or constant, the volume and intensity, um, and whether it's been enhanced in volume by range in range by any type of mechanical means. If an officer called the scene determines that a violation of noise ordinance has occurred, they can issue a ticket for a $50 civil citation. It's a civil penalty. 
and it's collected by the city in the nature of a debt. Um, police enforcement is one way that the noise ordinance can be enforced. The other way is that a a uh, complaint can be brought to, to the city's Noise Ordinance Appeals Board. Members of two different households can bring a uh, complaint to the Noise Ordinance Appeals Board, a board which consists of a police officer, an animal control officer, a development uh, services, uh, member of development services, and then two members of the public who you all appoint. Can hear the complaint, and if they determine that based on the evidence, they have a hearing, and the evidence and witnesses, they decide that uh, the uh, complained of party has violated the noise ordinance, then they can issue a $50 civil citation. And then if uh, next month we have another hearing because they keep violating the noise ordinance, they can issue another civil citation for $100. Goes up to $300 for a fourth or subsequent violation within a 12 year or 12, year, 12 month period. Is the interval of the um, citation, civil citation <clears throat> monthly? It's not a day, like a daily we have it's per incident. It's per incident, so the, mm -hmm. the board has to rule each time to each impose time. another, not fine penalty. That, that, that is right? correct. Yes. Okay. There are. So um, it doesn't just start rolling on a daily basis. That's correct. Okay. It's not like in other places where we have civil penalties in our right. ordinances. Okay. So um, that's sort of the broad background on our um, how we regulate noise currently. Um, so I'll switch gears a little bit. Talk about um, the revisions that are proposing here and. I've been the legal advisor for the Noise Ordinance Appeals Board since I came to work here four and a half years ago. And it took a few months of hearing, going to these hearings and realizing that nobody was coming out of the hearings for this Noise Ordinance Appeals Board very happy. Um, and then I started thinking, why is, that, why is that the case? It seems that a lot of folks were showing up to these hearings um, with uh, certain expectations about what the board could do to help them alleviate noise problems. They, well, the dog is barking, make them get rid of the dog or make them keep the dog inside. Um, make them turn the air conditioner off, make them stop yelling, um, make the bar close down, that sort of thing. But that board, as it stands under our ordinances, does not have that authority. They have the authority to issue a $50 civil penalty, which can then be appealed to the city manager from there. Um, it doesn't have the power to issue injunctions or do any of these other things. So folks were showing up, and so if you got fined $50, okay, um, but you weren't happy about it. But if you showed up and the board, even if they uh, ruled in your favor, and well, they got a $50 citation, it would still didn't do a lot to alleviate their problems. We kept seeing people coming back and again and again about the same barking dogs, about the same bar. Um, and it's been that way for years now. Um, so I've, because I realized this was the case, I, I asked the city's police, uh, the police administrative assistant, who was the secretary for the board, to direct all noise calls to me. Everybody who called the police department went to talk about the noise board got directed to me. So over the last four and a half years, I've heard about every barking dog, muffler that isn't on properly, neighbor mowing their lawn, yelling kids, the gamut. If you can imagine a noise problem, it's come to my desk. And so it's given me a little bit of insight to how the noise uh, regulation is working in Asheville. And I've identified some areas where it could be better. And so I've come forward with these proposals and I think of what I'm proposing here, this is akin to you bring your car to the mechanic, the mechanic looks under the hood, says, well, you need new spark plugs, your alternator's going bad, your timing belt's out of, out of sync, so you might want to change these things. If he says buy a new car, you're not going to say buy the, the car the mechanic tells you to buy. If the, the city, if the family wants to buy a new car, they need to come together and decide how they want to buy a car. But the mechanic says you need to change the spark plugs, you might want to listen to the mechanic to keep the car running just for the time being. That, that's, that is what I'm proposing here. I don't want to- The spark to, plug, not the new car. That's right. I, I don't want to oversell this, because I, I do not have solutions for uh, some of our most pervasive noise problems. I would say in the last few years, they shifted away from uh, even the bar being loud to, um, well, it, the bars are still loud. It's, it's shifting more away from the barking dogs and um, my neighbor's radio is too loud to um, commercial establishments businesses operating places where they are zoned to operate, but the noise is starting to intrude on other people's uh, private lives. And the best way to regulate that, I don't know. That's something the city needs to decide. And, and um, Ms. Campbell has uh, said that that's, she'd like to make that a next step in this, uh, in evaluating our noise ordinance more, more holistically. Um, so I want to keep that in mind as we go into this. This is not a, a cure-all. This is, like I said, the spark plugs. So that said, let's get into the spark plugs a little bit of what I'm proposing. Um, 
The first one would be that currently, as I said, violations are punished as a civil penalty. Um, unfortunately, years back, when this first came into effect years ago, the city c could file over in uh, court for free. Uh, we had, didn't have to pay filing fees to collect on, on our debts like this. Um, General Assembly took that away a few years ago. So now we have to pay filing fees just like anybody else. So the result is if we want to go try to collect on some of these fees follow suit to enforce our debt, um, we're going to actually pay more than we would end up collecting in, in filing fees. Um, so the proposal here is that to change the ordinance so it is punishable as an um, infraction rather than a, civil rather than a civil penalty. Not a misdemeanor, but an um, infraction. It's non-criminal, but it's still administered through the criminal courts in the nature of a criminal violation. Um, that would take some of the enforcement responsibility or the administration responsibility off the city and plus make these things actually enforceable. A number of these uh, tickets over the past few years have not been paid. And uh, this would do a lot to, uh, it seems more serious. So, so walk us through that. So it, it's an infraction. So you're given a citation by a police officer a police for officer. violating the ordinance and you'll have to go to court um, yes. to resolve that, that infraction. It's the same as a, um, a traffic citations are typically okay. infractions. And then the court would impose um, a penalty in the amount designated in our ordinance, I assume, and in, in, maybe they have a court fee on top of that or something like That's that. That's correct. It'd be okay. right here. I've, I propose $100. It seems to be in line with, uh, it actually would be an increase in the first time penalty. We, because we can't step it up to say $200, $300 per offense. Um, it seemed uh, natural to increase it at least as much as $100. But then there would be court fees on top of that, if, unless they're waived by the court. It also means that a citizen, so let's say the police show up, they just don't agree that um, the noise rises to the level of a violation of the noise ordinance. Um, a citizen can always go and try to convince the magistrate's office to issue a criminal summons or, or an infraction summons, it wouldn't be criminal, um, for an infraction of the city's noise ordinance. So they would still have an avenue outside of relying on the police department to enforce that. <coughs> so that, that's sort of the first level of this. The second one would be to disband the Noise Ordinance Appeals Board. And I, I recognize that there's a lot of folks who might feel that this is, this is not a good move. I, there are people um, who currently have some matters pending before that Noise Ordinance Board. And I don't want to dismiss their concerns or their complaints which are like they're not, ser not serious. However, if we do change to enforcing as, a, as an infraction, a board such as, like, constituted as such cannot issue a citation for an infraction. They can issue one for civil penalty, but not for an infraction. Um, I, as I said, I don't feel like the board has been particularly effective at, at um, dealing with claims over the past years. Not to say that the, the members of the board have not tried, have not done, done excellent work. Um, they have done their best, but sitting there in a conference room at the police department listening to people talk about noise when they're not on the site, and they are not in the best position to evaluate the noise or to um, weigh the uh, weigh the evidence. It's not a particularly conducive uh, forum for adjudicating those those um, complaints. So I would I would say that uh, the noise board should be disbanded. The third proposal would be to uh, do something that about construction noise. As I said, over the years I've been hearing all these noise complaints come in. Um, one issue where it's just we haven't got the tools to deal with it currently is construction noise. And as we all know, there's cranes everywhere in this town. Um, so it's the police called the sites that people are building oftentimes under city issued permits in locations where they've been approved to build. And they're going to be noisy doing that. And the police obviously do not uh, often feel like they are in a good position to issue a citation for construction related noise, even where someone is acting unreasonably noisy. So what I'm proposing here to regulate, much like other cities do with construction noise, Raleigh especially, this, this language is very close to how they do it, is that we issue an after hours permit. So from 7 till 7.30, uh, you're free to engage in construction on your site where you're permitted, um, Monday through Saturday. On Sunday, if you want to do work on Sundays or past that 7.30 p.m. time frame, <laughs> you're going to need to get an after hours permit issued by the city's building inspector. Um, the city's building inspector can determine whether it's reasonable or not. Um, and can issue a permit. He can also revoke the permit or modify the permit, set conditions on the permit, um, to help mitigate any of the noise problems. And 
There has been a provision in our noise ordinance, confusingly, where it appeared to give the building inspector the ability to issue these permits, but it actually didn't have that much effect. This actually puts some teeth behind it. They can issue a stop work order, they can pull permits if, if uh, people are not complying with the permits. Also, this does not have any kind of uh, restriction on distance. It doesn't have to be within 500 feet of a residential area, or and it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't, depends on, if you're going to have a permit for, for construction in Asheville, and you're going to be working outside these hours, you're gonna to need to get an after hours permit. Those are the, really the major uh, changes that, I, that I'm proposing here. The other ones are more minor, but still important. Uh, barking dogs, which I, I was reading back through all the city's ordinances, this was the issue back here. I think it was 1994. Boy, people were, were all over the barking dogs thing. Um, currently, the, we have a, authority to cite people for violation of our noise ordinance for their dog barking, but also in our animal ordinance. Now, if we were to change this so that it's enforceable as an infraction, animal control officers are not sworn law enforcement officers. They would not be able to issue citations that are infractions. However, they still would have their authority to issue um, civil citation, civil penalties through the animal ordinance in chapter three. All this would do is create an exemption from the noise ordinance so long as the noise is regulated through chapter three, our animal ordinances. <coughs> so it's more of a structural kind of uh, technical change. And the last one is to, there's a lot of redundant, hard to read language in our noise ordinance. I think a lot of the confusion that I was getting from people calling or from people going to the noise board, the thing's hard to read. It contains a whole bunch of, of a really large section of things that tend to be a noise disturbance but aren't a noise disturbance and it depends on how you're doing it. I, I cut that section out in this proposal um, just to make it easier to read, streamline it a little bit more efficient. So that's a lot of words, but. Uh, so yeah. I had a couple questions for yes, you. Um, so switching to an infraction, which sounds to me like littering or kind of akin to something like that, do other cities use the infraction concept? Is, would, you know, have you been able to see that or? No, most cities will treat it as a class three misdemeanor. And, oh, yeah. so they jump from infraction right mm -hmm. to a misdemeanor. They'll either do it as a civil penalty or they will go to class three misdemeanor. So, okay, so this would be something below. This is something below yep. that, and, that was, and that's certainly an option that's available to us, but I'm judging how, uh, speaking to members of the community, members of the city council, it didn't seem like that was something that we wanted to explore. And do, um, do you know whether um, in, in fractions like this, when you get over to Buncombe County, if they refer some of these to the mediation center? Because frankly, it's exactly what the, no, not no. automatic. Is it suggested as a resolution? So when you get an infraction, it is completely up to the determination of an assistant district attorney or the district attorney's office whether or not they want to dismiss the charge. Rarely do infractions have reduced cost. Uh, the actual court cost for an infraction is $188. If you add that on top of Plus the, the $100. $100 fee we're talking about, it becomes very expensive. And if someone misses a court date, uh, they could get another uh, penalty that's called a failure to appear, which uh, is an additional $200. And if they fail to pay that and take care of their court case by a certain amount of time, their license could be suspended. Once their license is suspended, we start entering down a slippery slope where this could become very... Um, it, it could be very interesting on how people end up making complaints on the noise ordinance. I don't want to go down that road, but it, it could be used in, in some very adverse ways. If people right, so, so, it just, so the answer is no, there's no automatic referral to the mediation center, it sounds like, but I assume they have that. Uh, yes. No. Um, okay. But, but, can I, but, but that's this, only if someone doesn't pay. I mean, so, wait. That's if someone ignores. Ignore, uh, Councilman Young's correct. If, if somebody just ignores the citation all the way, so they down get issued a citation by the police. No, but if they show up to court, they're going to pay. They're going to have to to resolve it. They'll pay. They'll either contest it, right, like you would, and, or if they want to plead guilty, so to speak, they're going to have to pay the penalty and the court costs, unless it's dismissed. And if it's dismissed, then they don't. Then they don't. But, but to to get an infraction, that would have to be either issued by a police officer and that police officer would understand the ramifications of that or a citizen would have had to to, to convince a magistrate to 
you know, to agree, right? That's and, correct. And the magistrate hopefully would refer them to a mediation center or something along it, those lines. It's my understanding oh, that, um, and I'm not the authority on this, but Buncombe County for years was getting um, lots of barking dog complaints. And so they now give, I think the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office will give folks a, what they call a bark packet. It's like you fill out like a log and uh, you, you document what's going on and they, they require uh, referral to their medi mediation center. That's coming something coming from, the, I believe, it was the prior DA's uh, Ron Moore's administration put that in place because he got tired of having to uh, hmm. deal with all the parking dogs. So it puts people through a process before they get there. So that is something that is done in that context. Um, so how about if the offender is an entity, a business, not, um, not an individual, and, and it's not related to construction? It, it applies, applies the same way. Typically what we've seen, say, for instance, a bar, you're going to cite the person who is in control of the premises, which would be usually the manager on site, maybe the DJ who stuck his speakers in the window. Um, somebody who's responsible for the noise is going to receive these That's citations. who would get the infraction. Yes. Hmm. But, the, but not them personally, them as a representative of the business, or them personally? Them personally. No, because it's, it's a criminal charge, it's criminal. so you have to... Well, do, yeah, the, I would just ask in um, uh, in the staff report it says the city manager has expressed interest in undertaking a more comprehensive review of the city's noise regulations. What give us a plan or or give or mm -hmm. please give us oh, a sense of that because I mean I think what. Um, what I suspect we might hear from the public is an interest in addressing the broader issues and especially the institutional noise that people are having problems with. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for, for the opportunity to uh, weigh in on this. Um, I think you heard uh, Mr. Maddox talk about that this, um, these changes that are being recommended uh, this evening are more structural. Uh, it does not uh, address the, what I feel are substantive issues related to noise, particularly those that, that impact um, residential areas, um, and in particular, uh, noise from commercial establishments like nightclub, bars, rest even restaurants these days. Uh, we would like to have um, a, another phase of community engagement, public dialogue, and um, involvement by our planning and um, community and economic development staff, as well as development services, uh, to to address some of these more broader issues. We, we also think that there has to be balance. Uh, we are a community um, that um, has a, a large sector of our economy related to tourism. But we also have an incredibly, um, I think, livable community where we want um, uh, our, our residential areas to be protected as much as possible. And so we're trying to find that, find that balance of maintaining the vibrancy that we have in our community, but also uh, to protect, protect the um, um, I guess the ability to, um, to, to, to sleep and enjoy life in your, in, in your home. I mean, I, I think we have to um, provide some of that. I don't know that, um, you know, I, I think you use the term, um, we want people to be happy. I, 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 you know, with this particular issue, um, what we want is a sense of reasonableness. We want clear lines of if you do these things, these infractions, um, there will be consequences in terms of penalties or, or whatever. We're, we're trying to clarify what those steps are as much as possible. So this next phase will be related to um, clarity of the artist's language, uh, a balance in terms of actually how do you assess and measure noise and the intensity of that noise and whether uh, someone has been um, impacted to the extent that 
it, it is not peaceful or, um, or whatever. Um, so that was a, a long answer, and I, I apologize going well, further. Well, so um, you, thank you for that. I, I, um, I, I guess my question is, is also uh, timing-wise and priorities-wise. I mean, is it something that it's something we're going to be launch. done by the end of 2019? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we are we are we are talking with uh, with staff uh, to get this launched and. I think it's really uh, important, particularly during the summer months, when I think that that's probably mm -hmm. when there's a lot of, of noise being generated just by the sheer amount of activities that can occur outside. Um, we, we would like to launch it uh, very soon in terms of the next phase. And in all honesty, I'm not sure how long it is going to take um, because it's such a... Um, such an, a, and, a, a, and an emotional a kind attorney. of issue. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we, and we, we have need. an interim city attorney who's eager to take this on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. We need a city attorney. Yes, she wrote me a note and said, please let me be a part of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did just approve and, and, an and, and put in signs right behind that. Well, there's the <laughs> sound in. Yeah. yeah. Be good. Um, I've got another question for John back on the infraction issue. So, do we. Um, if someone is cited and they're they're issued they're cited for an infraction, do they is there is their only option to resolve that to go to court or is, is there an option to pay a fine online or what what happens? It's typically going to be through through the court. They're going to need to go and speak. Have you ever? Have you ever gotten a speeding ticket? You can't pay an infraction online. Yeah, you, can. yeah. you can't you do can that. Pay an infraction. I, okay. Well, forgive me. I've never been cited for an infraction. I think I'm well, happy to say. So I don't know how these well. things work. Well. <laughs> You're just looking at me like I should know this. I don't know. Okay, so you can pay it so online. Pay online. Yes. Okay. And then, do you have to pay court costs if you pay it online? You always have to pay yeah. court costs unless you get it dismissed. Okay. So really, if you're cited for an infraction, we're talking $280? $188 in court costs for an infraction, plus whatever the penalty is. OK, so $288. So that's, that's, that's not an insignificant no, it's not. thing. Um, and, and John, what is your, so I think you know, we tend to hear from people who call the police and feel like the police don't respond appropriately and don't issue violations of the noise ordinance. Do, do you anticipate that these changes will um, increase the likelihood of the police issuing citations and infractions, or do you have any sense of that? It'd be a little bit hard to, um, to estimate that. Um, the police, they're, they're going to, in some situations, they're very well suited to assess the noise and say that this is, an, this is a violation of the noise ordinance. They, uh, it's a loud party in a residential neighborhood. It's two in the morning. You're gonna, you're, you're gonna get cited. I will say that there's, there's, I believe police officers have a little bit more comfort around issuing an infraction, writing a citation. They do that every day. They're used to doing that. Whereas civil penalties are something that they encounter a little less frequently, okay. and they might have a higher level of comfort there. But I really do feel like it's, it has to do with more the nature of the noise producing activity that they're encountering okay. and how they're able to, to perform Determine. that assessment. Okay. One thing I would note too, this goes to, to Ms. Campbell, I mean, we're, the standard has not changed right now, no. right? So it's still the reason, it's sort of a reasonable person standard, if you will. So, so even if an, an officer you know, cites an infraction, if that individual goes to court, that officer or the evidence is going to have to show that, that a reasonable person, that this would have offended the sensibilities of a reasonable person. And so to Ms. Campbell's point, I think is what she was saying is, as, as you're going to look at it more is, you know, other cities will have kind of a more specific decibel level you know, where it's a bit more objective as opposed to being able to say what, what does a reasonable person think or not think. And so, you know, as I understand what you're bringing forth to us tonight, Mr. Maddox, is, look, this is step one. You know, we see we have issues over here. This is not working the way anybody wants it to work right now. We understand that. Um, we are going to be looking at it comprehensively. But for the moment right now, in order to kind of deal with the issues we have right now, we're going to allow the, the current complaints to continue through the ordinance, th through the current process. But recognizing that it's not working for anybody, we're going to take these steps right now to deal with the structural issues, and then we're going to move to the substantive issues later this year, which will have a much more significant community engagement.
engagement piece. Is that a fair kind of characterization? That, that's a very fair yeah. characterization. Step one is a good way of thinking about this. Um, these, like I said, this is the spark plugs. Changing the whole standard, how you um, evaluate noise as far as decibel meters. Um, I understand some cities have a standard I, I kind of like, which is audible at a certain distance for certain noise activities. Um, a car is violating the noise ordinance if they can be heard 50 feet away, the radio can be heard 50 feet away from the car. Um, it's kind of nice, you don't need a noise meter, but you still have some kind of an objective standard there. This is definitely uh, a first step, though, and like Ms. Cam what Ms. Campbell's talking about, a second step, um, getting into those more, what's the new car going to look like. As far as the existing complaints, um, there are not many. There, there's uh, one coming out of the Kenilworth community, and there, there's a few downtown with uh, various bars. Those would be allowed to continue for 90 days. We'll get those resolved within 90 days. Um, I've heard some, uh, in response to this proposal coming out, some folks have said, well, well why can't they just kick the, the, the com people who are being complained of, the entities that are being complained of, kick the can past the 90 days? That's not going to happen. We will schedule the hearings. If the, com if the complained of parties do not want to show up and have their evidence heard, well, then just the um, complainant parties will can show up and give their evidence. Uh, so they, they would be scheduled and heard within 90 days. No new complaints would be heard, but this would at least allow the opportunity for uh, these groups to get their cases before the board resolved. Um, another question. Uh, sometimes ordinances contain an increasing penalty for additional infractions. Um, this doesn't do that, but did you consider that and, and reject it? Do other cities do that? or? That's something we do for civil penalties now because we can do that because it's I the nature see. of a debt. If it's an infraction, the court's got to have it's a set. It's just the one thing. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. I might add in the only additional penalty that you can, and for, for people who are wondering like why am I keep chiming in, this is what I do on a day to day basis. And I appreciate it. Um, so the only additional penalty that someone can get from the infraction is if they do not come to court and they are charged uh, with a failure to appear. And then that adds 200 extra dollars to the cost of the total ticket and then they get a letter from the DMV saying your license is going to be suspended in X amount of days if you don't get back to the court and take care of this. Well, and so, so what you're saying is we couldn't have a provision in here that says if you are issued a second infraction within 30 days of the first one, your penalty, your, your fine is $200. That's correct. We, we cannot do that. We can't do that. Okay. It would be another, it would just be another infraction. I mean, if, yes, you if it happened happen again. Yeah, no, I, I get it. it just... Well, for an individual, I think it will be significant. Sure. For, for uh, a large business, it the only reason it would be significant is because somebody's got to go to court. No, and that's so. maybe something that can be addressed in step two when we're talking more about how you would deal with commercial noise. If you're talking about maybe some kind of permitting, something through code enforcement, it might be possible. But there's no way we can issue individuals a warning that spells out the um, financial responsibility if they continue the noise because I mean, $288 might not seem a lot of money for um, a lot of people here, but for some people, <coughs> that might actually shake them into compliance. From what I've seen over the past few years, it's been the police officer's practice to warn first. Mm -hmm. You go, hey, knock it off. If we have to come back out here again, it's going to be, be a citation. I, I think, you know, avoids the paperwork. But I can't <laughs> say that's always going to be the they, case. Even if once it's a, if it's made a criminal infraction, they have the ability to, sure. to issue warnings rather than infraction, depending on the situation. Uh, okay, so anybody, if anybody has any other questions for John, this is the time. Otherwise, I'll need a motion, and then we'll take comments on it. So I, I will... Uh, Go ahead. I, I, will, I will move to adopt an ordinance uh, revising the noise ordinance. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion? Yes. Andrew, you were first, and then here, and then Martha, and then here. Okay. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Andrew Fletcher. Uh, and now I'm going to speak um, based from my experience as a downtown commission member, um, as well as a busker and um, someone who's thrown my share of loud parties when I first showed up in the city and had to deal and was on the other side of some of the police calls for noise. 
Um, so I have, I have some experience in this issue, um, but I have no experience with this issue at Downtown Commission, and I'll tell you why, because it did not come to Downtown Commission. Um, I really appreciate hearing about the future plans to implement community engagement, but not seeing them yet means that this isn't something I can support. Because usually when stuff comes before you, you have the benefit of staff's experience and you have the benefit of boards and commissions um, having looked at it and also the public weighing in at those boards and commissions as well as now. You're missing one of the legs of that stool um, as far as, you know, of all the information that you need to, to act to move forward. So I'm going to ask you not to, I'm going to ask you not to accept this. Um, because I, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the, um, the, uh, the one other time that this has been in front of the public, which was at Public Safety Committee, which um, Brian Haynes, who is not here from the transcripts, you know, even seemed to think that there had not been enough public input in it. I don't mean to speak for him, but if you, that was my recollection of that. Um, so I, f I feel there's been some serious lack of, um, of public engagement on this. And um, the consequences of this are really huge because, I mean, as a musician, I mean, sometimes one person's noise is another person's economic livelihood. Um, it's a very tricky thing, and I don't envy any of you in trying to decide this. I'm not saying that I have the answers either. But what I do know is that you don't have the benefit of public engagement that should have um, beaten this thing up on its way to you and improved it um, before it got to you to vote on. And that didn't happen. Um, and so I'm very skeptical that this is the way we start this process to discuss our noise ordinance. Um, and I am going to leave it at that. Thank you all. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Mannheimer, Council, and uh, City Manager Campbell. Uh, my name is Peter Landis. I'm a downtown resident and a member of the Issues Committee of Downtown Asheville Residential Neighbors, known as DARN. Um, I believe you all received a letter sent by Susan Robbins uh, regarding this issue. She's our chair. She could not be here this evening. Um, we appreciate the city's willingness to revisit and refine the, the noise ordinance. While we're disappointed that more substantive action regarding commercial noise will be delayed, uh, we are encouraged that City Manager Campbell is interested in pursuing more com complete solutions. We welcome that and we'd be, be very willing to take part and help out. We're also uh, very encouraged that Mr. Maddox recognize the growing problem that this is. Um, as Asheville grows, the solutions will become more and more necessary. Uh, we urge you to, uh, to recognize that downtown will continue to grow and change, and that downtown must be included in any update to the ordinance, especially as the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan envisions a denser, more residential downtown as a key to our common and hope quieter future. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council and Ms. Campbell, welcome to Asheville. We're glad you, that you chose us. Thank you very much. Uh, I request 10 minutes because I'm speaking on behalf of at least five other people in the room in our group besides myself. Okay, just go ahead and wave your hand, members of the group. Okay, thank you. Excuse yeah, Martha, just grab that. Yeah, you will. could just pull it down to your, yeah. I know, I'm short. I will, you will. Right. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening about this issue. Uh, I am Martha Salyers. I live in the Kenilworth neighborhood and have lived there for 35 and a half years. I'm a retired family physician and a practicing public health professional. And I've also been a member of the Kenilworth Noise Committee for a little over two years. I am here to comment on and raise questions on the proposed changes in the noise ordinance and how the city deals with noise issues. And I'm speaking on behalf of our Kenilworth Noise Committee. Uh, we represent residents living in Kenilworth who, uh, who are affected by the ongoing continuous noise originating in Mission Hospital. Uh, we've had about two and a half years of ongoing negotiations with Mission on mitigation, and it's been a long slog with uh, no end in sight. Most recently, we have come before the noise board, and we are one of those pending cases that Mr. Maddox mentioned. And uh, let me pause and thank Mr. Maddox as well for his um, efforts on the noise issue. We're highly amenable to mediation as a group, but as a reminder, this is an example of a very small neighborhood group in a dispute with one of the most powerful, soon to be private entities in the community. Thus, there's an enormous power differential when we're talking about our issue. 
How can counsel assure that such disputes are fairly dealt with and arrive, as Ms. Campbell said, at a balance between community needs and growth? I want to say what our issue is not. It is not construction noise, and it is not helicopter, ambulance, or other vehicular or episodic noise, but our issue is something that is not dealt with in the current or the proposed noise ordinance. And I appreciate the need to uh, create something that is akin to changing the spark plugs, but we would really like to urge you to replace the whole engine or maybe the electrical system while you're at it instead of um, having a very slow stepwise process. Our issue is continuous 24-7 operating noise of a large institution that affects our, neighbor, our neighborhood. This is an issue for the entire city as Asheville grows and commercial development encroaches on communities. You just heard from the Darn representative, and uh, every neighborhood is going to have to face this at some point. We've spoken with numerous other community representatives on the noise issues in their neighborhoods as well. This is an issue that also addresses multiple areas of the Asheville 2036 strategic plan. Equity, livability, clean and healthy environment, and air quality, and quality affordable housing, because quality should include the freedom from, to not be polluted by noise or uh, other uh, environmental pollutants. So I'd like to briefly address two issues uh, with the proposed changes. The first is the dissolution of the noise uh, board. We agree on the basis of our October experience in the noise board that it's not necessarily a terribly effective means of addressing noise issues. We received no communication in advance to us of how the board worked, and the quasi-judicial process was treated as a straight judicial process. The extended questioning of one of our members made it impossible for the rest of us to be heard. Also, there did not seem to be any de facto scientific expertise on the board in the form of a sound scientist or public health or medical input. And we were not notified that the city was considering dissolution, even though we have a pending issue. Uh, when were we going to be told? For our purposes, the proposed 90-day limit on resolving our issue may be inadequate, so we'd like you to, to consider uh, either not doing that or extending it, considering the pace of the last hearing and having already invested over two years in our process. But the board has two missions, not just hearing disputes, but also advising council on noise issues. So if it's disbanded, how will council continue to get these, uh, this advice on noise issues? Uh, moving on to the proposed ordinance, I'll limit these comments to questions raised rather than answered by the proposed ordinance. Um, the first being whether this proposal is actually that much of an improvement over the existing proposal. I think I am persuaded that the construction issue is significant enough to cause a fairly immediate um, change, but again, we'd really like to push for a comprehensive noise ordinance along the lines of what Mrs. Ms. Campbell was talking about. For, to start with, there are inadequate definitions in, in the proposed noise ordinance. It doesn't really... Uh, it, define terms that are even used in the ordinance, like sound vibration, recurrent, intermittent, constant, intensity, or even FAA. Uh, important terms that are not defined are include loudness, sound measurements, emission, emission, quiet zones, and other terms. There also was, a, in the memo, a claim of inefficiencies, but not a detailed explanation of why these inefficiencies existed, in, in, exist, in, including inability to uh, recoup revenues. Uh, maybe the fault is not with the noise board, but there is um, more to the process that needs to be evaluated. Also, the proposed ordinance does not address at all um, commercial noise, but that's self-confessed, and I know that that will be part of the future process. But chronic noise polluters, repeat offenders, and most pertinent to us, it does not define or address constant or continuous noise pollution. Uh, measurement standards are not addressed, and uh, there was a mention of uh, uh, using decibel measures versus uh, auditory measurements. Uh, there are many examples of communities that do both that could be researched. Also, we wonder why infraction is proffered as the only option for punishment. For example, the municipal, municipality of Charlotte has a menu of civil penalties, infractions, or misdemeanors. Could we look at that, as well as stepped uh, penalties? Um, speaking as a public health physician, professional and a physician, there doesn't seem to be any evidence base 
scientific consideration addressed in the proposed ordinance. We're not just talking about noise disturbance, but potential damage to developmental, physiological, and psychological health across the life cycle. This has been exhaustively documented by the Environmental Protection Agency, the World Health Organization, and multiple sound scientists, medical, and public health professionals. What is the evidence base for the proposed change, and where did it come from? Also, who are the subject matter experts who were consulted on these changes? What research has been done on uh, model noise ordinances in comparable municipalities? There are many available. Um, and studies on the e effectiveness of those ordinances. So we wonder why the rush to change this ordinance? Uh, is there a way that we can, as previous speakers have talked about, have much more public involvement as well as scientific involvement in the crafting of a comprehensive noise ordinance that the city deserves? Thank you for the opportunity to address you. On behalf of our committee, we look forward, forward to continue to work with you and other neighborhoods to improve livability, promote equity, and assure quality affordable housing by decreasing noise pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so for anyone who hasn't already wa waived their time, um, yep, Casey. Hello, my name is Casey Campfield. Um, I have two concerns that I can think of right now with this proposed ordinance. Um, the first being that the potential for subjective application of this kind of uh, law is so great that I think increasing the criminality, moving it from a civil uh, issue to a, uh, a, a penal issue or you know, um, having to go through the justice system for this is uh, worrisome. I, I fear that these kinds of complaints might be directed towards minority families, people that are already getting an undue amount of attention from law enforcement in town. The second concern that I have is that any flat fee, and I mean, it doesn't just go for this ordinance, but all the fees in the city, but we can start with this one because we've got to start somewhere. Any flat rate fee is by its definition regressive. Um, as Councilmember Smith brought up, uh, $288 is not going to be something that dissuades a major construction firm from continuing to make noise in neighborhoods. $288 could put a, a poor family out of their home by missing a bill, a necessary bill. So anytime you, you know, say you apply a fee like this to a family that just had a, a family gathering that got a little bit uh, rowdy and noisy, $288 could be devastating to them. And at the same time, you're not gonna do anything to stop noise from these larger uh, private firms that are you know, building and expanding in the neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, I, just a point of clarification, there is um, a proposal in here to deal with the construction noise through the permitting process, but not through the infraction process, yes. Um, anyone else wishing to speak on this one? Yep, okay. So, as, so long as you haven't already waived your time for another speaker. No. Okay, all right. Um, my name's uh, Diana Davidson, and. I am a member of DARN, um, downtown resident, but also of CAN, the Coalition of Asheville Neighborhoods. And I just came from a meeting, actually from CAN, so I was late and I missed all of the comments on the um, Haywood Street project. And I have to say, um, that was a, a wonderful experience. I was sort of a volunteer staff with Chris Joyelle on that uh, project, and it was quite an adventure. So I would like to say that um, applicable to the noise ordinance, I think the community engagement piece is really important. Um, and I understand that your intention is to definitely carry that out. So I feel like um, the progress made to, right now, tonight on the ordinance is a really um, good first step, and I think we should um, continue and take the momentum and engage the community. And um, a, a place like um, CAN, Coalition of Asheville Neighborhoods, and DARN, as well as a smaller neighborhood, as many others, would be happy to participate, and I think it would be a really good, good thing. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else who hasn't already waived their time? Or yep. I'm Philip Lenowitz. I'm the chair of the Neighborhood Advisory Committee. And just last month, sat here and gave a presentation, and noise was one of the issues that we heard. So commendation to Ms. Campbell in her short time for taking on this issue. Uh, it needs to be addressed and comprehensively. A concern, though, is 
the issue of community involvement before this ordinance came forward. The members of council had questions, a lot of questions about it. The people in the community haven't had an opportunity to give some input. So before you vote on this, before it goes forward, perhaps there could be an opportunity to hear from people in the community about these changes that are being proposed. That's my suggestion. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on the item? Uh, hi, my name is Jonathan Wayne Scott. It was kind of a busy week for crime this uh, past weekend in Asheville. There was a murder in um, in West Asheville. Uh, there was a really unfortunate, horrific uh, incident going on at the mall, which then you know elucidated the fact that there's a tremendous amount of police calls going to the to the mall, and you know the heavy-handed nature of making this a criminal situation and putting a further burden on the police is just not uh, sensible and it's um, I just don't think that it's going to do anything for the already kind of stretched thin resources at the police department so that's just all I kind of have to say about that thanks anyone else Esther, can I just clarify, the, the police are already in charge of enforcing this, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking about Jonathan's comment. I, I think there probably would be um, a, a slight additional involvement of police, though, because um, when you prosecute an infraction, they would, they would be testifying. So there would be some additional work other than, I mean, they already are the first responders to these types of calls, but there would be some additional work. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, Council, we have um, a motion and a second. We have a lot of, uh, we've heard a lot of comments tonight. This is our first uh, brush with the noise ordinance. I'm trying to think if we've, if we've, if we've had it, uh, when the last time was that we had it before us. Um, you know, this is a struggle for me because this noise ordinances are inherently problematic because they attempt to be a one size fits all and that is not how we deal with noise in our community. And I think council's been pretty eager to do something because frankly, we get a lot of complaints emailed to us, but they tend really to be um, mostly around commercial activity. We occasionally get a construction activity claim, uh, complaint and half the time the, the contractor is in violation of the rule around construction and they are told that and they stop doing it. And other times it's some odd exception where apparently you have to pour concrete at four in the morning. Um, so, but it's a temporary uh, uh, inconvenience, I guess, is, is how I characterize it. So, you know, we're, we're so to, to answer the question of why the rush, why now? I mean, in, from my seat, it doesn't feel quite that rush because we've been hearing com consistent complaints, um, particularly around Mission Hospital and the Kenilworth neighborhood and the salvage station and the mulch yard to the Monford neighborhood. But, uh, but this, obviously, the proposal tonight addresses m really more the individual complaints um, and, and does somewhat address the commercial complaints, but, but recognizing that we're gonna have to do something more comprehensive to try to get at that. You know, I, I would be comfortable with, with continuing this process if, if there is, if, if we need to go back to, to going ahead and looking at a comprehensive rewrite rather than doing one piece now and looking at that comprehensive rewrite. We have lots of committees that um, could, could look at this and one was the downtown commission was mentioned. I think this was handled in public safety. There are other committees that could take a look at it. I'm not gonna use the dreaded blue ribbon task force because I know I'll just get a community eye roll for that. But, um, but, it, but it may call for some, some more concentrated look, look at it. It's a complicated issue. I've, I've only dipped my toe into it and tried to look at some of the ways that different cities have dealt with it. And it, it is, um, it, it's definitely uh, challenging to say the least. So I don't, I, don't, I don't have strong feelings about whether or not we have to vote on this tonight. If there's not an urgency in the community about doing this piece right now, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with waiting until we have a, have a long term, have a longer period of time to look at it. Um, I have been a uh, liaison for the, board, for the noise ordinance uh, committee since I've been on city council and have, pretty much gone to every one of the um, meetings 
Uh, and uh, I, I do think it's important that we, we look at some of these sort of comprehensive plans, I, I mean, look at it more holistically. But I, but I am fully supportive of making the changes, the, these changes that John has suggested um, immediately, uh, staff resources and frustrations, to me, way out, um, way out, and I think this, these are well thought through uh, adjustments that I would I would like to see immediately impact, immediately instituted, and uh, with the with the idea that we will, with all due speed, address uh, the other the other issues comprehensively. So um, I would ask that we have a vote. Just, and I, just to one thing you mentioned, Gwen, and and I think the there was um, in the extended comments about the the way the city should be looking at this scientifically and with research. I did I did have a moment. I would like to remind remind the community. I did have a moment that of course that is ideal, uh, but we are limited in terms of staff resources. We have so we have so many wonderful plans and projects in the pipeline that staff has worked on, and we've had consultants help us work on already and we have that many more projects that need attention and that we we also need to work on so while i agree it's um it it would be ideal to be able to to approach it this way and maybe that is possible we do we do you know we don't have a noise uh, scientist or specialist on staff we don't have medical um you know the city doesn't doesn't deal with Health, like the county does, for example. So, I, you know, I just think to myself, I'm looking at this um, project in terms of a staffing uh, issue, and it, it's quite a heavy resource lift. Is all uh, I, just the point I'd like to make. You guys had. Can, can I ask another um, point of clarification? I'm sorry to sort of back the conversation up for a second, but the the infraction versus misdemeanor. I mean, misdemeanor that is also a that is a criminal charge as well, right? And what is, if, I think you did this and I must have just and missed it. Less a, a misdemeanor is, is, is a criminal charge. It is right. the, the lowest level of criminal charges. It, it, for an ordinance, the city can impose a class three misdemeanor um, is the highest level of criminal charge that the city can impose on someone. Infraction as they step back from that is non-criminal. It's just administered through the criminal process. Okay. Okay, so it's it's actually sort of backing off a little bit. Yes. Okay. All right. That that's helpful. The, uh, yes, then the misdemeanor yeah. option. Okay. Um, thanks, John. I appreciate that. So I'm I'm with Gwen on this. I think um, these changes seem to me to be pretty small, mainly a cleaning up of things that are not working well. And from from my perspective and my experience, the only thing worse than not having a <laughs> not having any recourse for the public is to have a recourse for the public that's completely ineffective, which is what I think our noise board is right now. Um, so I think getting rid of it so we can just sort of start clean and fresh on addressing the commercial noise problems uh, are, it, I, I think that's fine. This, this, none of this seems to be, a, it, it all seems to be in the positive direction. And I, I do appreciate, John, you taking this first step. Um, I think it was my last meeting on public safety over a year ago. Uh, I asked that we start looking at, at the noise ordinance, and so I'm glad that that's happened. And, and I really, um, I do think, though, that the, bigger, the biggest piece is the commercial piece. We've got to get there. We've got to figure that out. And it sounds like that is going to be a, a robust process with public engagement, as it should be. I'm not going to support this, and I'm going to tell you why. I don't have a problem with looking at the noise ordinance and retooling it, as someone mentioned, putting a new engine in or whatever. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is, well, one, I'm glad I'm here at this very moment because that's why I believe I'm, I'm supposed to be here in moments like this. This hasn't even been looked at through an equity lens. And what I do on a daily basis directly intersects with this. When you start talking about charging people with an infraction, there are also, well, let me back up. We look at our lives in a bubble. We, we all live in our own silos, in our own bubbles, and we see our lives 
day to day, our friends that are around us, our neighbors that are around us, things that affect our lives on a day to day basis. There is a potential for this uh, ordinance uh, with the charging of an infraction to open up uh, unintended consequences for other members of our society. And I am not comfortable at all opening up, opening up new pathways into the criminal justice system because you may think a dog is barking too loud. That's you living in your bubble, in your space. Whereas this ordinance could, may, could affect other people's lives in a very adverse way. I, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, enter failure to appears for thousands of every Buncombe County resident in the, in, in the uh, county of Buncombe that misses a court date. I see on a day-to-day basis how regardless of what, an, what, what, what is subjective into writing an infraction, how it affects people's lives. Councilwoman Smith made a good point. I see that $188 plus $100 fine might not be a lot to some people, but to others it may affect their lives in a detrimental way in a sense of you may think this ordinance is just addressing the noise from the club down the street or the loud neighbors. This could be used to be subjective in other ways to other, other, other folks in our society. And when you get folks coming to court, you don't think that everybody's going to pay what they're supposed to pay. Because when I say I enter thousands on a, on a weekly basis of failure to appears of people who uh, don't pay their infractions, it snowballs into something different. They don't come back to court. Maybe they got a dead tag. They get the failure to appear. The DMV says, uh, your license is going to be suspended. Their license is suspended. They get pulled over for driving while license is revoked. Then they have to come to court again. For some reason or another, maybe people don't show up. It sounds like a lot, but it happens every day to thousands of people in Buncombe County alone. And then you don't show up to court for your driving while license revoked charge. Then you get an order for arrest. Then you're picked up somewhere else. This is not just about, when you start talking about opening up pathways into the criminal justice systems, there are unintended consequences and ramifications that don't just affect you on your front porch listening to somebody next door with their music, or the dog barking too loud, or somebody having a civil dispute. It could end up being somebody driving up at a stoplight and their music might be too loud for an individual. It's subjective. How do, how do police officers make that subjective determination. Don't just think it's going to be from a phone, phone call of a neighbor with a noise ordinance complaint. You are now giving uh, uh, folks the opportunity to, to, to write these infractions without somebody making a phone call and complaint. Officer pulls up to me beside my car. My car, there's no way to say if my, my music in my car is too loud, but that officer can write me an infraction. I'm not supporting this because I don't think it has been, and, and don't let my dissent on this matter be an affirmation to any group or individual entity that came up here that gave their own personal dissent. My dissent is not your dissent. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with you. I'm just saying that what, what, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis affects people's lives in a very detrimental way and opening up new pathways into our criminal justice system is not equitable. I heard a lot of people use the word equity. Well, this ain't equitable and it might not be because of what you think it's equitable for. So I'm definitely not gonna support this and if you move forward to this, you are making a, a, it's not just about the noise ordinance. It is bigger than that. I'm completely happy with moving on to a next meeting, letting other uh, boards of commissions look at it or whatever it may be. Maybe HRCA, maybe they could look at it. I don't know. Maybe our, uh, our equity department in Kimberly Archie can look at it. I don't know. But I know what I see on a day-to-day -day basis with everyday people that I deal with where this small infraction becomes a very big thing. And don't just think that it's going to be somebody calling on the phone about a bar down the street or their neighbor next door. This can now be used as a tool to give people infractions, to, to, to walk up to people. Uh, we, we, we've talked about all sorts of things, there's written consent and all this other stuff. This opens up a, a larger door. And the criminal justice, I, I am totally not comfortable opening up a new pathway into our criminal justice system. I am just not gonna be a part of that. Y'all can be a part of it if you want, but Keith Young will not. So I'm not gonna vote for it. So I, I'm sorry, I have to ask some clarifying questions then based on that. 
<laughs> so, but VJ, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I mean if, if I may, I mean, I, I made the motion, and I'll, I'll continue with, with the motion to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to approve this. I mean, to, to respond to some of the council member Young's points, as, as Mr. Maddox just stated, um, this, is actually, this is actually pulling back from going from a misdemeanor to an infraction. No, 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 no. Currently, it's a civil matter. It's handled by our noise appeal it's not board. In the criminal justice system. He, he, I think Paul's just saying other cities treat it as a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Was that? So, well, that We're not in the criminal list. justice system with oh, this yet. Yeah, it goes to a, we currently have a civil penalty. This would be an infraction. Go to, well, you got to go to the. You approve it tonight. We go into the criminal justice system. Right. It would be. A, it would be. A, be straight it, it, yeah. it is administered by the courts, but it is specifically in the statute as a non-criminal violation. So, but and currently, I, it is a civil matter only. That is correct. Is, and it is heard by our noise oh, appeal is. commission, which is well, not in the criminal justice system <clears throat> at all. That, that is absolutely correct. Uh, one point of clarification: I I do believe license revocations apply to infractions for motor vehicle offenses? No. Uh, well, under for, 20, for, for, under there, there are two types of failure to appear. 24.2. There are, uh, like you said, there are some for non-driving uh, non motor, motor vehicle uh, infractions, mm -hmm. and there are for, for motor vehicle infractions. Now, which one this would apply to? I don't know. I can't say that. We haven't done it yet. I don't know. Um, but what I am saying is very true. As far as failure to appears and leading to, there are certain ones to, to be corrected that do lead to license suspensions. Mm -hmm. Others are not reported to the DMV. Which one this is, I can't tell you. I have no idea. We haven't done it yet. So, so John, in your memo, when it says the changes include punishing violations as an infraction rather than a misdemeanor, that sentence does not mean it is currently a misdemeanor yeah. and we that's, are making That's correct. And, okay. and I, I apologize for that lead any confusion. Currently, it is a civil penalty. Civil penalty. Um, and, and the, so when the decision initially was when this was permeating, we'll make this a misdemeanor under the words. So, well, no, let's go, not go that far. Let's make it an infraction. Right, that's why. I, yes. I see. Okay. So I, didn't, I, I did not realize that. And so if someone's issued, uh, if, the, if the police finds that there is an infraction, they issue whatever it is they issue. Ticket. Ticket, somebody can appeal that to the noise board? No. Or no. no. So, so under this just, proposal, so you're going to be in that building. It's out of, it's out of your hands. Okay. It is yeah. over okay. in the courthouse. Yeah. Currently, a police officer would issue a civil penalty. Okay. Right, a civil penalty. It's $50 civil and that's, penalty. And that that could be appealed to the here. noise ordinance appeals board. It can. Right. Okay. Okay. Clarify? Mm. Yeah, that, I would agree that that's a major change. I had not realized that. Well, okay. Does um, so we have a motion and a second, and I don't hear anyone wanting to comment any more about this. So I think this needs a little more marinating here. Well, I mean, there is a motion, on and the there floor, is a motion. So. so I'm just commenting that, in my opinion, I think there's. I, I really appreciate the hard work that's gone into this. I know it's been difficult. We are not fully staffed in the legal department. We are down a full-time city attorney. So Sabrina is doing her best as our interim city attorney. Uh, we also don't have an official um, deputy city attorney either. So, so this is a very difficult undertaking, uh, especially since this is kind of a specialized area of law, uh, I would offer. So um, personally, I'm going to vote against this tonight, not because I don't think we need to do some serious work on our noise ordinance, uh, and not because I don't think ultimately some of these changes are going to be incorporated into a final product. But I don't quite think we're ready, and I, and I need a little more time to consider the shift from moving this civilly to criminally. Um, uh, yeah, although I realize an infraction is not criminal, although handled by the criminal justice system. So I, I'm list, looking at an important defense attorney back there smiling at me for making the, he could probably educate us all on this. Um, so that, that's where I'm landing tonight. Um, I'm hopeful that, it, that I, I do know this is gonna take a while. This isn't gonna happen tomorrow. I'm looking at our city manager because I know it'll be quite an undertaking. All right. So I, I will, I, in light of that, I, I will withdraw the motion to do this. I mean, I will say, you know, as, as we go through this and, and staff spends a, and a lot of time with us trying to explain it, 
Um, I understand how we have questions here as well, uh, and and that's good. I mean, we're this is part of our deliberation, but you know, having some of these discussions earlier on, before we spend you know an hour or so doing this, if we have concerns like this, that we need some more time. Um, just as a as a council member, it would be <laughs> the earlier we know about that, the better it is. So we don't gin everybody else up and and uh, kind of go through go through this particular process would be helpful as well, but I, I will withdraw the motion. Okay. okay. Well, good discussion. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, that concludes the printed agenda. I do have um, some folks that are signed up to speak, uh, so I'm going to call those out. This is an opportunity to speak on any topic that was not on the agenda. Again, you need to state your name and you will have three minutes. The first person I've signed up to speak is Rochelle Cox, who I think I saw leave. She left, yes? Okay. Um, Jonathan, I have you next. Hi, my name is Jonathan Wainscott. <coughs> Hope everybody's uh, 2019 is going well. If everyone could just take the conversation out in the hall. Thank you. Can I get my clock set back for a second? <laughs> Do over. Do over. 2019 should be a, a better year in Asheville. We can breathe a little bit because we don't have an election happening for the first time. Um, this is, of course, by way of Senate Bill uh, 813 being passed, which is the uh, city district bill. <coughs> And that bill was uh, essentially made to come to fruition by the efforts of Terry Van Dyne, who authored the, what we'll call the even year amendment, which in addition to the districts, shifts our election cycle to the even numbered years. Um, Senator Van Dyne has kind of been singled out as uh, a, a turncoat and a traitor to Asheville for not, um, for taking this on herself to make this happen. Um, in the Asheville Blade, it actually uh, w was reported that um, perpetual turncoat Senator Ver uh, Terry Van Dyne actually sided with the GOP's racial uh, gerrymander, supposedly in return for the bill agreeing to move the city elections to even numbered years, a change that neither Ashevillians or their representatives had sought. And I find it hard to believe that Terry Van Dyne did this. Uh, just on her own uh, volition. So uh, I know that you're not obliged to answer me here, but could you possibly add some clarification? Did anybody on city council ask Terry Van Dyne to make this amendment? So this is the part where you get to talk to us. This is the part where you, okay, so then, <laughs> Since I talked to you in an email and, you, and asked you this question, you responded to me and said that you did request this of Senator Va Terry Van Dyne and that you did and do support the even yeared uh, amendment and that it would be helping uh, to improve voter turnout. And I thank you for that because I'm in favor of the even yeared cycle. That was part of what I ran on in my epic uh, last place finish in 2013. So I'm, I'm really stoked that I can agree with you on uh, this issue. 2019 should bring some great change. We can maybe come here and find different ways that we can agree with uh, one another. So um, uh, thank you for responding to me personally about it. And uh, great, I hope uh, 2019 uh, continues to improve. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Next person I've signed up to speak is Matilda Bliss. Matilda, thanks y'all. Have a good evening. Um, I saw that the proclamation was uh, acknowledging Asheville's role in racial trauma, inflicting racial trauma in Asheville. And uh, just want to add a little bit of history for folks who aren't aware. In 1967, in order to secure bond money to, um, for urban renewal projects in Southside community, um, 
there was a referendum held, I believe it was spring that year, which was rejected by the public uh, by overwhelming margins. It was brought back. And later that year, actually, where it did secure the necessary votes after intensive um, mobilization of, of city allies in the black community that was, that was switched around, the public opinion was switched around in one year because of the government's intervention. So looking at the fact that overwhelming numbers of Ashevillians voted um, against these districts. We don't want it. And yet, that was a while ago. Why are we still, why are we still not filing action on this? Is it because there's something that the public's not aware of here? Is it because there's a, there's a shift that's intentionally being put into place? to deny the public's opinion on this? Is there, a, is there a middle road where we'd rather keep certain candidates here and still have an election this year, but disadvantage new candidates? These are things to consider and that the clock is ticking and that council must act now to file these motions because if we wait till we have a, another city attorney It'll be too late for us to have a fair election this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Matt Shepard. He left. He left. Okay, thank you. Rupa Roos. Um, let me first say I'm so glad you just avoided creating a new pipeline into the criminal system. Um, Members of the council, I stand before you yet again to advocate for both low-income renters and this time also low-income earning landlords. I understand you favor, or, uh, you favor um, people using honey to garner your attention, but when folks are needlessly placed through a pressure cooker, they are not going to be putting out sweet tea. Um, so distracted are the big dollar developers are the big, so distracting are the big dollar developers and loophole seeking investment piranhas that um, are burdening our town that an entire microeconomically connected group of your constituents is being raked over by your planning development office. I believe I've emailed all of you about some of the issues that I've faced. And we're being raked over by the development policies that are not proactive, but only preserve the status quo in a four-day work week for your department heads. All while leaving your lower level employees in those departments to either turn a blind eye or apply ridiculously stringent uniform hurdles. If you'd like to maintain a diverse economic population in our town, co-housing and creative repurposing of existing homes is necessary. It's beyond time, I wrote this right before I walked in. Uh, it's beyond time to rein in your paralyzing development code departments, which enable real estate and development pilfering instead of um, nurturing landlords and long-term existing homeowners in sharing space with less ec economically endowed neighbors. Low-income boutique landlords serve a critical role in the economic strata of low-income individuals, as we often are the ones who are willing to forego the standards that corporate landlords insist upon, all while being forced to jump through arbitrary decisions by code development enforcement officers who have thrown out record-keeping um, and are only assessing situations as if everything was newly built I'm dressed the way that I am because I just came out from underneath the basement at my house because the zoning code enforcement officer this week has decided to cite me for not latching a coal hatch on my 1915 house. He doesn't know what a coal hatch is. Same officer also told me today that certificate of occupancies were thrown out by the state, so they're not enforceable, but they're not 
uh, applicable, applicable. However, they are because they, prov they prove if a condition was previously existing. I have two things that I really just want to share. Make permitting fees in the department sliding scale based on income and not project cost. Second, regarding the multiple kitchens, just allow the grandfathered ones to exist and stop allowing permits for second kitchens. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, I, next, I have um, Casey Campfield signed up to speak. Thank you. Uh, I am back again today to urge you as strenuously as possible to fight the Senate bill to district Asheville's city elections. Uh, we're nearing February and we don't know whether we're having elections again this year. The assumption is that we're not. Um, but if you act, we could do something about this. These kinds of laws have been overturned in other cities. You all have expressed, most of you have expressed, uh, you know, dissent with this law. 70% of Asheville's voters, 70%. I've never witnessed a, a referendum that had such a strong turnout in one direction. 70% of Asheville's voters do not want these districts. Uh, we do not want the state government, particularly this current state government, drawing districts in Asheville. Uh, they are not necessary. There's nothing wrong with our current uh, system. And we have not heard anything from you all about this. Uh, and we need to know what's happening. We need to know where you stand. We need to know whether you are going to choose to act on this. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anyone else signed up to speak, but if there's anyone who has not yet spoken who wants to speak on something not on the agenda. Yes. Oh, you want me to Good evening. My name is Kim Roney, and in 1910, my great-grandmother was born here in Asheville, North Carolina. It was when she was nine years old that the 19th Amendment um, was passed by Congress allowing women the right to vote. It took 45 years. Her daughter's daughter, my mother, was five when the Voting Rights Act was passed. So I stand here today um, bearing the burden of the people before me, lifting up people who demanded inclusivity and the right to vote, like Sojourner Truth and Horovida Idar and Inez Milholland, um, knowing that my students are watching and that it will affect them. And I call on you that our parents to think about what the districting of Asheville will mean, not just for Asheville right now, but for Asheville in the future. Um, to be able to, in a year where we're dealing with new voter ID laws, to unite Asheville around our shared needs and to do something to fight the districting in Asheville. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, so we don't have a closed session tonight, which is unusual. Um, but uh, on the districting issue, I would just um, offer that we have asked the interim city attorney to go ahead and um, solicit some legal advice for us. Uh, um, Ms. Rockoff is not an expert in election law, it's sort of a, a, you know, a specialty area of law, but there are some attorneys in the state that are experts in this area, and we've asked her to reach out to some to advise us about what our options are. Um, the the bill, interestingly, does not take away Asheville's right of referendum, which previous districting bills in other cities did. So, you know, one question is, is that option open rather than a lawsuit? If it, if it is, is that a better option? If it is, how do you do that? When does it happen? Um, and if there, and if there, if one of the options is to file a legal claim, which obviously it is, what is the strength or weakness of that legal claim? The um, most recent case that you might hear about is the Greensboro case, which was decided in federal court. Two things of note in that case is that the decision turned on the fact that the legislature took away Greensboro's right of referendum, and that was the basis of the judge's decision striking it down. We don't have that situation here. We are in an unprecedented situation. So um, I'm sure there are many lawyers who are eager at the opportunity to make new law on this issue. But we, we really need 
some expert advice uh, to, to make a decision about how we go forward. The other um, thing to note is that the, the amendment that moved our elections to even years was not part, as I understand it, was not part of the, um, a change to our charter. And therefore, there, there really wasn't uh, any discussion I heard around a legal, even a potential legal challenge to that piece of it, because it wasn't, it wasn't it, uh, changed to our charter, unlike the districts, which is a change to our charter. As I, uh, if I'm capturing that correctly, that's what I heard in terms of that. Um, and I, you know, I will add that um, I did support, and I do support, the move to an even year election, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I had many conversations with Senator Edwards about the district bill, many, and, and, some, and folks on council did as well. And we urged him not to do this. We went down to the legislature and spoke to them. We, we met with him here and spoke to him. And my, what I said to him is, if you are going to do this, which I don't think you should, uh, meaning don't do the districts, if you do, I, would, I asked him to move the elections to an even year uh, because in my opinion, it would help with voter turnout because we don't have, we have, you know, we have a, the lowest turnout, I believe, in municipal years, be, frankly, because it's the only thing on the ballot and there's no other, no other uh, thing to vote on. Um, and, and Senator Terry Van Dyne was, um, she, she, she was acting on, on, at least on my behalf in that request to, to move the election to an even year um, if we had to have the district <coughs> bill. Now, I cannot speak to the vote on the district bill itself, but as to the amendment, um, I did favor that if we had to have the district bill. So, uh, and, and actually since then, I understand that at least three more municipalities in Buncombe County are gonna request the same change um, this next <laughs> legislative cycle. So, uh, so maybe there's some interest in moving it to even years, to even years as well. So, and I know there are pros and cons to that and people have different, different opinions about it, but. Um, and can I just add one thing? Yeah. We, we did, uh, so our previous city attorney, Robin Curran, did, um, we did have a briefing from her on this, I think in her very last closed session, and she was very clear in saying, because I was, oh, sorry. I sorry. don't think you want to give <laughs> legal advice and waive uh, privilege. Well. So more on that um, right. when we figure out how to talk to you about it this in a way that legal. doesn't. No. Okay. This was her interpretation of, I do not so, I mean, it's obviously a challenging situation for us because we, we, we are managing this in a closed session format because we're receiving legal advice about it. So, um, we, we, but we haven't been able to continue that process because we've right. been working through an interim city attorney situation, now realizing that um, we are gonna be reopening the advertising for a city attorney. So realizing that process is longer than we were anticipating, we've asked um, Sabrina to go ahead and help find helps get us some legal advice on this and continue that conversation. So I appreciate those of you who've come here tonight to talk to us about that topic and I hope that gives you some information about where we are with it. Okay, I don't have anything else. We don't have a closed session and we're adjourned. <laughs>